from home, have you? Perhaps you've seen it. Maybe in a dream. A murky, forgotten land. Souls may mend your ailing mind. You will lose everything once branded. The symbol of the curse. An augur of darkness. Your past, your future, your very light. <laughs> None will have meaning and you won't even care. By then, you'll be something other than human. A thing that feeds on souls, a hollow. through the door and trot along to the kingdom. But remember, hold on to your souls. They're all that keep you from going hollow. Oh, I'll fool you no longer. You lose your souls. All of them. Over and over again. <laughs>
Hello everyone, this is Aegon of Astora, and welcome back to Dark Souls 3 Let's Talk Lore. This is episode 21, being recorded on Thursday, June the 4th, 2020. I hope you're all having a fantastic day, whenever it is you find yourself watching this. Hi friends, it's been more than a year and I sincerely apologize for that, but as I explained in the previous episode as well as at the end of my Sekiro playthrough, it was necessary for me to step away from the channel for a while so that I could focus on completing my dissertation. Of course I did say that you wouldn't see another episode of this series until my dissertation was finished, but for reasons I'll explain later, I'm not there just yet, though I am getting closer. In light of the pandemic, however, I figured it was time to put another episode out. So here we are. I'll give you an update on my dissertation and job search later on, but for now, I just wanted to say that I've been keeping you all in my thoughts, and I hope that you're all doing well. I'm sorry that I've not been able to provide you with any content during this difficult time. I did originally plan to record this episode along with Cassative and possibly a second guess as well, but because I'm not quarantining alone, it was just not possible for me to put aside the 4 or 5 or 6 hours I would need to record commentary along with a guest. So for the first time in a while, I'm going at it solo for this episode. Finally, I'd like to express my sincerest thanks and gratitude to those of you on the front lines of this pandemic. Whether you're a grocery worker, a courier, a mail carrier, healthcare worker, really anyone doing essential work right now. I honestly don't know how you do it day in and day out, but do know that you are appreciated and that this episode goes out to you, as well as to those of you fighting systemic racism in the US and elsewhere in the world. As you can probably imagine, I have a lot to say about the many political, economic, and social problems raised by this crisis, but I'll leave it at that for now and return to that rant at a later date, when the worst of this pandemic and everything else going on is behind us. In the meantime, I hope this episode provides a worthwhile distraction from the sheer awfulness that has been the year 2020 up to this point. So having said all of that, let's finally turn to have a closer look at the untended graves. As always, we're going to start with a little fun with definitions. Untended is an adjective meaning not cared for or looked after, neglected, and grave meaning a place of burial for a dead body, typically a hole dug in the ground and marked by a stone or mound. Used as an elusive term for death, or a place where a broken or discarded object lies. So a couple of interesting things about this overlay here. First, you can see how very long it's been since we've done an episode of this series because in that time, Google has started adding images, among other things, to the definitions that are provided when you type define colon and then the word into Google. And the second thing being that I guess none of these really capture the Japanese meaning of the name Untended Graves, if Yosoho's guidance is any indication. But when looking at the meaning of this name in a vacuum, Untended Graves means this is a graveyard that is not cared for or looked after. It's neglected. 
According to Yosoho, however, the area name slash bonfire name in Japanese is actually unmarked grave. The area boss, which I guess we'll talk about later, is Gunda or Gunda the hero. The NPC summon is not in fact swordmaster, but just expert. But Yosoho noted that unmarked grave is the closest word they could find. The Japanese meaning is grave for someone without relatives. You can search some picture by using that. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, give a proper burial to some anonymous person isn't a western thing. So as sad and depressing as it is, I think Yosoho's right here in the sense that if you don't have anyone and you pass away, they're like, no one is going to get you a gravestone and, and write something nice about you on your gravestone. So you would, in essence, either have an unmarked grave or you'd be, and obviously this is getting very dark given <laughs> the present situation of everything going on right now, but yeah, it's kind of sad. This actually brings to mind in Toronto, in downtown Toronto, I believe it's near the Eden Center, there's a non-denominational Christian church whose name presently escapes me, but they have outside, and I'm not sure if it's just a coincidence that it's outside of this church, essentially it's a monument to all of the John and Jean Doe's who have died in Toronto over the years. So all of the people who had no one to identify them, no identification on their person when they died, they were just classified as John or Jean Doe which, if you're not aware, means essentially it's a null identity. You don't really have an identity if you're a John Doe or a Jane Doe. You're just, again, an anonymous person. So if I'm understanding Yosoho's notes here correctly, in effect, this is the same thing, in that these are graves, there are people in these graves, but they're not anyone noteworthy. In, in fact, they're so unnoteworthy that their graves are unmarked. So moving on to our list of friends for the area. So these are all friends that we've encountered elsewhere in the playthrough up to this point, but we are going to review them nevertheless. So we have, of course, already encountered Black Knights in this playthrough, first in Farron Keep and then second in the Demon Ruins, but I want to say that there are more Black Knights here than there are in either of those two areas. Although I might be wrong, because I know there's at least two, possibly three in the Demon Ruins, but regardless, they have a decent amount of HP and they give a decent amount of souls. So just over a thousand HP and they give you 2000 souls in new game. They have a number of random drops, including their Great Axe, Great Sword, Shield, and Armor set, as well as Embers. They don't have any special abilities. They are weak to Dark and Frost. They are resistant to Poison and Toxic, so those two are paired. They go together, which is why there's an ampersand there, in addition to having a resistance to Bleed. But they are immune to nothing, they have no enemy type, and you can't use Alluring Skulls or anything of the sort against them. So in turning now to their random drops, they have a chance of dropping a Black Knight Great Axe. Great Axe of the Black Knights, who wander the land, used to face chaos demons. The unique attack of this axe greatly reduces enemy poise, reflecting the tremendous size of the enemies that the knights have fearlessly faced. Skill war cry let out a spirited war cry that temporarily boosts attack and enables a special consecutive strong attack. Black Knight Greatsword, ultra greatsword wielded by the black knights who wander the lands, designed to face chaos demons. So something I only just noticed, and I don't know if this means anything, if this is a translation thing, maybe in Japanese the exact same word is used, but the Black Knight Greatsword is said to have been designed to face Chaos Demons, whereas the Black Knight Great Axe is described as having been used 
to face chaos demons. So it's entirely possible, and if you look a little bit more closely at the weapon itself, you can see that it's covered in blood, which is, yeah, rather gruesome. I guess appropriately so, but the Great Axe, it would seem, was perhaps designed for other purposes, but merely used to face chaos demons, whereas the Black Knight Greatsword, which is in fact an ultra greatsword, was designed to face chaos demons. But I'm digressing already, so the Black Knights constantly faced foes larger than themselves, and this sword's unique attack greatly reduces enemy poise. Skill Stomp use one's weight to lunge forward with a low stance and increase poise, and follow with a crushing strong attack. So again, maybe this was designed specifically to face the Chaos Demons, whereas the Great Axe was designed for more general purposes. Because recall that the Black Knights were not always the Black Knights, they were once Silver Knights. So it's possible that the Great Axe was used before, but was just used against the Chaos Demons because they that's what they had, so they used it, whereas the Greatsword was specifically designed for those engagements. Although the fact that both items describe the enemies as being massive and that that's why this does so much poise damage would suggest otherwise, that there's no significance to the difference in how these two weapons are described. They may also drop the Black Knight Shield, Shield of the Black Knights who roam the lands. A flowing canal is chiseled deeply into its face. Long ago, the Black Knights faced the Chaos Demons and were charred black, but their shields became highly resistant to fire. I'm not sure that that's how that works, but <laughs> regardless. <laughs> oh, Dark Souls. And finally, Black Knight Armor. Armor of the Black Knights who roam the lands. The Knights served the First Lord Gwyn and followed him into the flame upon its linking. They became ash, but still wander the realms to this day." So of course, I've talked about this in previous episodes, in I imagine both the episode on the Farren Keep in the Swamp as well as in the Demon Ruins, because this was always one of the items on my wish list when it came to the Black Knights, and I've mentioned previously that the initial idea, as I understand it, in Dark Souls 1, sort of like the Forlorn Invaders in Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin, that the Black Knights were supposed to just pop up wherever, randomly, throughout the world, because they were spirits that are wandering the realms to this day. And of course the remnants of this are still present in the entrance to the Kiln of the First Flame in Dark Souls 1, and it remains to this day a very striking sight. So next we have the Cathedral Grave Warden. It's worth noting that the Cathedral Grave Wardens are different from the Grave Wardens, and we'll get into that in a minute. But as the name suggests, we first came across the Cathedral Grave Warden in the Cathedral of the Deep. The Cathedral Grave Wardens actually have more HP than do the Black Knights, despite the fact that they give fewer souls. So they got 1500 HP and they give 750 souls when you defeat them in New Game. And they actually have quite a few random drops, including the Warden Twin Blades, the Grave Warden Set, in addition to large Titanite Shards and Titanite Chunks. Their special abilities also include Elemental Attack Fire and Ailment Bleed. So this ties back once more to their connection to the Cathedral of the Deep, which you'll recall, and I can't remember exactly which episode it was, and you'll, <laughs> you'll all have to forgive me for that, because of course, it's been more than a year since I last recorded an episode for this series, and about four years since this series first started, so I might not remember as quickly and as sharply 
as I used to, uh, the various points in the game and where we discuss things and where certain enemies are placed. But in this particular instance, you'll recall that we discussed, I want to say that it was the second episode on the Cathedral of the Deep in which we had Cassidy and JSF join us. And we discussed this idea of the cleansing of impure blood that is taking place at the Cathedral of the Deep where the evangelists in particular were using bleed weapons to cause people with impure blood to bleed and then they would burn away the impure blood with elemental fire attacks. So again, it really is no accident that these friends have both a bleed and a fire attack because they are cathedral grave wardens. Interestingly, they're also weak to bleed and I'm not sure if that is meant to suggest that they too are somehow impure. And now that I think about it, that might actually be it because they're also resistant to poison and toxic. And as we know, to be poisonous and toxic in the context of Dark Souls 3 often means that you're impure in some way, shape or form. These friends are hollow as far as their enemy type is concerned, which also means that Alluring Skull and Rapport are both effective against them. So the term Warden means different things depending on where you are, and we'll get into that in a second, but the first definition of Warden that's listed here, and it's a noun, is a person responsible for the supervision of a particular place or thing, or for ensuring that regulations associated with it are obeyed. So in terms of synonyms, you have many here, including superintendent, supervisor, steward, overseer, caretaker, janitor, etc. In terms of alternative definitions, there's also a church warden, and in a British context, the head of certain schools, colleges, or other institutions. So synonyms for that being principal, head, governor, master, mistress, provost, president, etc. Or the North American meaning of the term, which is the one with which I'm most familiar, being from Canada and all, is the head official in charge of a prison. So in this particular instance, I don't think it's unfair to say that pretty much all of these are valid, even a church warden, I think, if for no other reason than the religious or spiritual connotations associated with the act of dispelling impure blood and then burning away the impurities associated with it. Although I will note that it's very interesting and this is something I've talked about in the past. I want to say in the episode on the undead settlement in which I related Foucault's notion of disciplinary power, which is in place in prisons. I explained how the same principles underlying the idea of the automatic functioning of disciplinary power in prisons how that can also be made to relate to the automatic functioning of disciplinary power in schools or educational institutions more generally. And so in keeping with my suggestion that essentially all of these definitions work, including the one which suggests that a warden is essentially a caretaker or a custodian in a sense, the grave warden wrap, which they drop randomly, reads rotting tattered wrap attire of grave wardens at the Cathedral of the Deep. Grave wardens were tasked with disposing of the ever-rising corpses that plagued the cathedral. Their clothes are utterly putrid, drenched in the blood and mucilage of their undertaking. And we've got some pretty tremendous words to unpack here, including putrid <laughs> as an adjective of organic matter, decaying or rotting and emitting a fetid smell. So synonyms include decomposing, decomposed, decaying, decayed, rotting, rotten. Of or characteristic of rotting matter, and informally also meaning very unpleasant or repulsive. Mucilage is a noun meaning a vicious, okay weird, it reads a vicious secretion or bodily fluid. I think it is supposed to say a vicious secretion of bodily fluid, but it reads or bodily fluid, so I'm not sure. <laughs> a poly, oh I can't, I cannot read this word, 
a polysaccharide substance extracted as a vicious or gelatinous solution from plant roots, seeds, etc., and used in medicines and adhesives. Or in a North American context, an adhesive solution, gum or glue. So it seems that, at least if the North American definition applies, these grave wardens have so much blood on their clothing that their clothing is essentially sticky. There's so much blood and bodily fluid stuck to their clothing that their clothes are sticky. To the point of effectively being an adhesive, which is, yeah, gross. <laughs> and they also drop Warden Twin Blades, paired weapon wielded by the Grave Wardens of the Cathedral of the Deep. The Grave Wardens of the Cathedral, who put down reincarnating corpses, wield weapons that cause profuse bleeding, for the loss of blood and bodily fluids is said to slow reanimation. Skill Spin Slash slice into foes with a large spinning motion and continue spinning to transition into strong attack. Profuse is an adjective meaning, especially of something offered or discharged, exuberantly plentiful or abundant and the archaic meaning of a person lavish or extravagant. So these weapons cause exuberantly plentiful bleeding, in other words. How else are you supposed to put down reanimating corpses, I guess? So all the more power to them, I suppose. Next we have three Corvians and a Corvian storyteller, starting with the Corvians. And I have a lot to say about the Corvians, and I'm going to do my very best here to save as much of that as I can for the episode or episodes, more likely the latter, on the painted world of Ariandel. I've already forgotten whether it's Ariandel or Ariandel. I want to say Ariandel, but I'm pretty sure it's Ariandel. In any case, I'm going to do my best to save the majority of what I have to say for those episodes. There is, however, something significant, I think, about the placement of the Corvians in this area, and we'll get to that shortly, as well as a bit later on when we read some excerpts from Cassidy's essay on the subject. But in the meantime, the Corvians don't have a ton of HP, 792, and in New Game they drop 150 souls. So not a ton of souls, but they do have several random drops, including the Corvian Great Knife, which I do love the idea of a Great Knife. They do also drop the Great Corvian Scythe, as well as a Shriving Stone. The first time we came across these friends was, of course, in the Road of Sacrifices. Though I don't think we talked about them a great deal at that time. But again, we will be talking about the Corvians at much greater length in the episode on the Painted World of Ariandel. In the meantime, the description for the Corvian Great Knife reads, Dagger of the Unwanted, those guided by heretical storytellers. A rather large dagger with a powerful attack. But this transparent attempt to intimidate phobes reveals much about its owner's fears. Skill, blind spot, use against shielded foes to break through their guard by attacking from the side. And so this is a classic question as far as this weapon is concerned. It raises a classic question, I should say, which is at what point does a long sword become a bastard sword? At what point does a bastard sword become a great sword? At what point does a dagger become a long sword or a broad sword? I could be screwing up the classifications and how they lead into one another, but my point is essentially that this weapon is a transitional weapon or a liminal weapon which sort of exists between weapon types. I want to say that I recall hearing that this weapon was very, very overpowered in PvP. I don't know if that's still true. That it consumes very little stamina as you're using it, and that with the right infusions, you can actually get a decent amount of damage out of this weapon. But uh, again, I, I could be remembering that all wrong. Heretical, of course, and this isn't in reference to the Corvians themselves, but the Corvian storytellers, but Heretical is an adjective which means believing in or practicing religious heresy. Someone who has heretical beliefs. 
So synonyms include dissident, dissenting, nonconformist, unorthodox, heterodox, etc. And the antonym listed here is orthodox. So holding an opinion at odds with what is generally accepted. So of course, in the context of Dark Souls 3, this is very much a religious issue that the Corvians are heretical because their worship runs counter to that which is endorsed by the power structure in Lothric, or at least the power structure that is in place in the Cathedral of the Deep. I'm thinking in particular of the Cleansing Chapel, where a statue of Velka has been completely, or not completely, partially obscured by a, I guess, Deacons of the Deep nativity scene of sort. I know it's not in the strictest literal meaning of the term nativity, a nativity scene, but it's nativity scene-esque, the image of all the deacons in, I guess, what is a model or a, di a diorama of the deacons doing their thing. But yeah, to worship as the Corvians do in Lothric is heretical, because they do not conform with either of the dominant religions in Lothric. Great Corvian Scythe, Great Scythe of the Forlorn Souls Guided by Heretical Storytellers. The mistress of the painted world is said to wield a great scythe herself. Great scythes, that's a tough word to say in plural, great scythes <laughs> inflict profuse bleeding such that the blood splatters on the wielder. Skill, neck swipe. This attack aims for the scruff of a foe's neck and, when successful, functions as a headshot, inflicting heavy damage. So in returning to the overview for the Corvians, I just realized that I completely skipped over everything after the random drops because I was so excited to get into the random drops, but the special ability for the Corvians is Scythe Ailment Bleed. So in other words, their Scythe causes bleed and their weakness is also bleed. And so while I questioned why that would be in the case of the Cathedral Grave Warden and suggested that maybe it indicated that they too were impure in some way, shape or form, in this case, it actually makes perfect sense because again, given this reference to the mistress of the painted world, that immediately brings to mind Life Hunt. That Life Hunt, when you're using it, it not only inflicts bleed on the person on whom you're using it, it also inflicts bleed on oneself. So it makes sense in this particular instance that they would have a special ability to inflict bleed, but that they would also be weak to bleed, or at least vulnerable to it. And before I skip this point for a third time, it's worth noting that the Corvians are also vulnerable to rapport as well as alluring skulls, despite not actually being hollow enemy type. Generally speaking, if an enemy is vulnerable to alluring skull and rapport, then they're likely hollow enemy type. Although I could be just imagining that. So in returning again to the Great Corvian Scythe and this reference to the mistress of the painted world, you could interpret this in a few different ways. First, you could very simply assume that at the time the base game for Dark Souls 3 was released, that this was simply a reference to Priscilla from Dark Souls 1, because she was the mistress of the painted world of Ariamis. Second, if you believe that Lady Frida was a part of the storyline all along and that it was always intended, whether through DLC or it ended up being cut in the main game, that we would go to the Painted World and confront Frida, the so-called mistress of the Painted World of Ariandel. Or you could say that it was meant to apply to both, that the reference to the mistress of the Painted World works both as a reference to Priscilla, as well as a sort of misdirection slash foreshadowing for what was to come in the Ashes of Ariandel DLC. <sighs> I'm pretty sure I'm oscillating back and forth between Ariandel and Ariandel, and I apologize because I know it's going to drive some of you bonkers, but <laughs> all I can do is say I'm sorry because I can't remember which is which. 
So just to clarify, mistress meaning as a noun, a woman in a position of authority or control. In a British context, a female school teacher who teaches a particular subject, a woman who is skilled in a particular subject or activity, the female owner of a dog, cat, or other domesticated animal, okay, um, and archaic, a female head of a household, especially formerly a female employer of domestic staff. And the second possible definition being a woman having an extramarital sexual relationship, especially with a married man. Certainly the first definition here works for both Priscilla and Sister Frida. And finally, I can't exactly recall what the significance is of the Corvians dropping the Shriving Stone, but the description reads, a gem of infused titanite, also known as Stark Stone, reverses weapon infusion, has the benefit of undoing the effects of infusion without reducing the reinforcement level. Turning now to the Corvian Storyteller, and I'll try to remember to go through all of these items here before proceeding to the item descriptions, but the Corvian Storyteller in this particular area has 792 HP and drops 400 souls on new game. They have random drops, including Storyteller's staff, as well as a hollow gem. So I guess it's noteworthy that they drop a hollow gem as opposed to a Shriving Stone. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it's a thing. They have special ability, elemental attack, fire, as well as ailment, poison. And it's not listed here, of course, but they have the ability to aggro the Corvians even if they are, and this doesn't really apply here as much as it does in the Road of Sacrifices, that they have the ability to aggro the Corvians. Like the Corvians, they are weak to bleed even though they can't inflict bleed status, and they are vulnerable to alluring skulls as well as to rapport despite not being a hollow enemy type. Storyteller's Staff Staff of a heretic storyteller who shares tales of the painted world to forlorn souls. The storytellers too are wretched beings with no place to go. Their bodies, souls, and even their staves are all tainted through and through. Skill poison spores, expel noxious spores from the formless, parasitical things that inhabit the staff. Forlorn is an adjective meaning pitifully sad and abandoned or lonely, or of an aim or endeavor unlikely to succeed or be fulfilled, hopeless. So of course given that the Corvians are perpetually in a state of seeking home, without the ability to actually go there, at least the ones that are not in the Painted World, the, the ones that are in the Painted World are, at least when we arrive there, not really <laughs> doing much better, but they are missing something. They're forlorn, they're unhappy, they're sad, they're despondent, dejected. So all of these synonyms are apt in describing them. And of course in Dark Souls 2, we also have the forlorn, which, are a little bit different, but more or less the same. I, I imagine that they probably used this word with the intent of drawing that parallel between the Corvians and their state, their lot in life in Dark Souls 3, and the Forlorn in Dark Souls 2, who are just sort of wandering spirits, seeking something, but they're, they're not quite sure what. Wretched is an adjective meaning of a person in a very unhappy or unfortunate state, of poor quality, very bad, or used to express anger or annoyance. So another couple of words from this description that I perhaps could have defined through foam with definitions, but noxious meaning essentially poisonous, and parasitical, which means essentially like a parasite or a leech, something that leeches off of something else. So this staff is essentially covered with parasites that are without form, and that is where the poison comes from. That's where their special ability to poison people comes from, which is really interesting. Um, and maybe we'll explore that a little bit more later on, again, maybe in the episode on the painted world of Ariandel because I do find that very interesting, but I'm not sure that I have too much more to say about it right this moment. And so in looking at the item description for the hollow gem, I guess 
The significance in them having this as opposed to the Shriving Stone is simply that this contains a reference to Londor, Land of Hollows. So even though the Corvines are obviously not Hollows, they're something else, they are susceptible to things that Hollows are susceptible to, like alluring skulls and rapport. I'm not really sure what else to make of this, but it is perhaps worth noting, I said earlier it was worth noting, it is perhaps worth noting that they drop Hollow Gems as opposed to Shriving Stones, like the plain old Corvines. So next, we have the plain old Grave Wardens. And this actually confused me quite a bit as I was preparing for this episode, because I always knew that the other Grave Wardens, I always knew them as the Grave Wardens based on their drops. For example, they drop the Grave Warden Wrap and not the Cathedral Grave Warden Wrap. So I was very confused in putting together this list and trying to under wait so who are the grave wardens <laughs> and who are the cathedral grave wardens i thought it might have been an error in the guide that i used to uh the the prima guide that i used to put together this table here but no there's no error there are the cathedral grave wardens who are the Grave Wardens with the Warden Twin Blades. And then there are the plain old Grave Wardens, whom we first encountered in the Cemetery of Ash, the very first area in this game, which of course we explored in episode one of this series, which aired at some point in late 2016, almost four years ago. But these friends are not especially formidable, they can be in large groups and they will swarm you if you give them the opportunity to, but they have 399 HP and they only drop 160 souls. I assume that's much more than they did in the Cemetery of Ash. Likewise with the number of souls they drop in New Game, which is 160. Though their random drops are, I believe, the same here as they were in the Cemetery of Ash, which is the cleric's sacred chime, and a large soul of a deserted corpse. They have no special abilities, they are weak to poison and toxic. Their enemy type is hollow, which of course means that they are susceptible to alluring skulls and rapport. Cleric's sacred chime, sacred chime for casting miracles of the gods. Chimes such as these are often given to clerics who become undead. Equip a talisman or a sacred chime to cast miracles. Miracles must be attuned at a bonfire before use. Skill Gentle Prayer Recovers HP for a period of time, albeit extremely slowly. Works while equipped in either hand. So unlike the Cathedral Grave Wardens, which I don't think there's any indication that they are clerics, these Grave Wardens are clerics. Um, I'm not sure that I have a good sense of the significance of that, if anything, but I think it is worth noting. And they also drop, interestingly enough, a large soul of a deserted corpse. Large soul found in a deserted corpse, used to acquire souls. Let the Firekeeper transform this sovereignless soul into a source of strength, for to be unkindled is to be a vessel for souls. So of course, I may have forgotten a lot of stuff that we've talked about in this playthrough up to this point, but I do distinctly recall having a very in-depth discussion in either episode one or episode two about the idea of sovereignless souls. So I'm not gonna go into that here because I know I have already discussed that at great length and with a great deal more preparation involved as well. But it is worth noting, I think, that these friends drop this item. I think I've made this point already in an earlier episode, but you can interpret this as this is their soul, they are sovereignless souls, um, or they're a deserted corpse, or you can interpret this as the grave wardens who are tasked with looking after these graves are in fact looting them because they are of course hollow, not really quite sure 100% certain what they're doing there and why they're there. Um, all they know is, as hollows, soul's good. Body, soul, take, 
body takes soul. Me hungry. No, I'm actually legit hungry. So let's <laughs> let's let's get on with this. Ravenous crystal lizard, of which there are of course two in this area, as opposed to the single ravenous crystal lizard that we fought in the cemetery of Ash. But they each have just over 2,000 HP, and they drop a pretty decent 10,000 souls when you take them out. They of course don't have random drops, but a fixed drop of a Titanite scale. They have an elemental attack magic. They have no weaknesses, they are resistant to magic, immune to poison and toxic, bleed and frost. So in other words, don't try to use your poison arrows and cheese them from a distance. <laughs> Thanks FromSoft. But at the very least, you can aggro them one at a time. And that's of course the approach we're gonna take a little bit later on when we come across them. So I've said from the beginning, I love the idea of the ravenous crystal lizards and the fact that in Dark Souls 3 more generally that they've expanded on the idea of crystal lizards as we'll see in, I believe the next episode, we're going to Arch Dragon Peak where we will encounter yet another variation on the crystal lizard. So I like that they expanded on the notion of the crystal lizard in this game. And in this particular instance, what would happen if we had a crystal lizard that was ravenous? In other words, one that was extremely hungry or very great or voracious. They have a ravenous appetite because as is clarified in the item description for the Titanite scale, in rare cases, crystal lizards devour souls, growing to monstrous proportions and leaving these great scales. So again, an idea I like a lot, and I love that they expanded on the Crystal Lizard in this game. I don't love fighting them, but it is pretty cool, I think. And finally, we have the Starved Hound, of which there are several in this area. They have 450 HP, and they give a paltry 180 souls. They have no random drops, no special abilities, they're weak to fire. They are enemy type hollow, which is very interesting. And effective items, of course, include Alluring Skull and Rapport. And then of course we also have Daughter of Crystal Kremhild. And see, this is why punctuation is important because this name, as it appears in the game, suggests that this invader is the daughter of someone named Crystal Kremhild, rather than someone named Kremhild, comma, Daughter of Crystal. And this is a good example of the reason why I always tell my students that punctuation, grammar, and spelling aren't important because grades are associated with them, but because attending to proper spelling, grammar, and punctuation reduces ambiguity and makes it much clearer to the reader what you're trying to say. So ultimately, it's more about clarity than it is about satisfying your overbearing teaching assistant. So I'll have more to say about Krimhild later on when we encounter her in the Grand Archives, where we'll be forced to confront her again along with the other remaining Black Hands. But for now, it's worth noting that she actually appears to be wearing a Firekeeper set, save of course for the mask, suggesting that she might have been a Firekeeper at one point in time, at least until she became a student of the Crystal Sages. Which is also to say that in this context, daughter means something like student or follower, which is hinted at in the description of her staff. And though we're not supposed to pick it up until the Grand Archives, it reads, Crystal Catalyst presented as a gift by the Crystal Sages to their favorite pupil, Krimhild. Crystal spheres devour the will of the user, and this staff increases the potency of sorceries at the cost of increased FP consumption for skills. Skill, Steady Chant, boosts the strength of sorceries for a very short period, works while equipped in either hand. 
Interestingly, and I have no idea what this means, if anything, but in searching for this name on Google, in order to get some pronunciation guidance, I came across this very interesting Wikipedia page. Apologies in advance to all my German viewers out there. I think something like 5% of my viewers are German, so my apologies to all of, all of you out there, as well as to my own grandmother, as I'm probably about to butcher the pronunciation of pretty much everything on this page. But it reads, Gudrun, or Kremhild, is the wife of Sigurd, or Siegfried, and a major figure in Germanic heroic legend and literature. She is believed to have her origins in Ildiko, Ildiko last wife of Atlia the Hun, and two queens of the Merovingian dynasty, Brunhilda of Austrasia and Frig Friedegund. Again, I must sincerely apologize, but yeah. <laughs> I've never been tremendous at pronunciation. Uh, and yeah, uh, stuff in other languages is especially problematic in that context. But continuing on, in both the continental German and Scandinavian traditions, Gudrun or Krimhild is the sister of the Burgundian, Burgund, Burgundian king Gunther or Gunnar and marries the hero Siegfried or Sigurd. Both traditions also feature a major rivalry between Gudrun and Brunhild, Gunther's wife, over their respective ranks. In both traditions, once Sigurd has been murdered, Gudrun is married to Etzel. Oh hey, that's actually my grandmother's maiden name, Etzel. Um, Gudrun is married to Etzel slash Atli, the legendary analog of Atlia the Hun. In the Norse tradition, Atli desires the horde of Nibelugen, which the Burgundians had taken after murdering Sigurd and invites them to his court, intending to kill them. Gudrun then avenges her brothers by killing Atli and burning down his hall. The Norse tradition then tells of her further life as mother of Svanhild, an enemy of Jorman Wrecker. Jorman Wrecker. In the continental tradition, Krimhild instead desires revenge for her brother's murder of Siegfried and invites them to visit Etzel's court, intending to kill them. Her revenge destroys both the Huns and the Burgundians, and in the end, she herself is killed. So, again, perhaps one of my um, more ill-advised moments deciding to read this slide out on the show without having had any practice in the pronunciation of any of these names, but that aside, if there's anything to be gleaned from this, I suppose it's that perhaps daughter of Crystal Krimhild is hell-bent on revenge for something. And maybe this institution of linking the fire that she was sort of born into, such that she's invading people wearing her former firekeeper set, or maybe she's trying to keep us to access the mysteries or the, the secrets that are behind Champion Gunder. Maybe she's the firekeeper who Gunder was late in meeting. I don't know, there's a million possibilities this is just something that was interesting that I thought I would read out and see if anyone else had any ideas about it because I'm sure at least a few of you out there are a great deal more familiar with this story which I'm not at all familiar with and the significance of uh, Gudrun or Krimhild. And so if you're one of those people and you have some idea what any of this means then let us know in the comments section below. It's probably also worth noting that we also find Swordmaster here, first as a summon in front of the boss room, and second as a corpse near the pit in Firelink Tower. And that's actually the same place we find him as a hostile, unkindled NPC following our encounter with Udex Gunder all the way back in the first episode of this series. And you know, I've never really been too sure what to make of Swordmaster, and I'm not sure that I have too much to say about him here, but we'll see if his corpse contains anything interesting item description wise. Otherwise, I'm as always open to hearing what all of you out there think, so leave your comments in the comment section below if you have anything to say about Swordmaster, why he's here, what his significance is beyond I guess the surface level stuff that's covered in his item descriptions.
Oh no! Oh no! You may have noticed that I chose to start this episode in the Cemetery of Ash and not the Untended Graves. Or did I? <laughs> Now, there is obviously a lot going on in the intro cinematic, so you may have missed this, but if you go back to the very end of the intro cinematic, you'll note that the player character Aegon of Astora screams in the Cemetery of Ash, and John Grimm appears to hear him screaming in the Untended Graves. While, as I've explained previously, the events unfolding in the intro cinematics do follow a consistent set of rules, the point I was trying to make here is very simply that the Untended Graves and the Cemetery of Ash are effectively, essentially, as far as the game's mechanics are concerned, the exact same area. The only difference between the two areas is a set of flags, the most notable of which is the Time of Day system we discussed in the previous episode, with reference to Lance McDonald's tremendous video on the subject. We're going to take manual control of the game's ceremony database, which is a set of parameters that Dark Souls 3 uses to dynamically change the world state or time of day. Here in the Cemetery of Ash, where the game begins, we can see that we are able to switch over to another ceremony ID to transform the area into the untended graves, which we would normally reach far later in the game. This same system is also used to trigger the dark sign eclipse that appears in the sky for the game's final act as well as the storm that rolls in at the end of Arc Dragon Peak. Interestingly, however, FromSoft was actually inconsistent in how they applied these flags to the untended graves, and it's not really clear to me whether or not this was intentional or a developer oversight, and again, that's more or less the question with a lot of these issues. Is this something that they intended to put in the game or intended to have in the game as a clue? <laughs> And I'm laughing because I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a true story in a FromSoft game, but the question here, as with in many other places in Dark Souls 3, is did the developers intend to do these things, or was it an oversight? But even in the latter case, that can actually give us a clue as to what the developers were thinking when they created a certain area. So, again, I'm rambling, but the point is that the only difference between the untended graves on the one hand and the cemetery of ash on the other hand is a set of flags. So what do I mean by that? In order to answer that question, I'm going to briefly discuss a number of examples. When you navigate to the quit game tab in the menu, for instance, you'll notice that FromSoft did not change the name of the area from cemetery of ash to untended graves. So if we assume that Cemetery of Ash in this example is 1, and Untended Graves is 2, then as far as the name of the area that gets imprinted in your save file, they didn't change the name of the area for Untended Graves to 2. It's still set under 1, which is Cemetery of Ash slash Firelink Shrine. On the other hand, however, these appear to be different areas because a large hole appears in the cliff facing in the Untended Graves, which does not appear in the Cemetery of Ash. I don't know if this is actually how it works because of course I don't have access to the map viewer or anything like that, but I suspect that if we were to use no clip mode to fly through this wall here, we would find ourselves in the King's Antechamber and then the Consumed King's Garden. So all of this is to say that FromSoft created a set of unique flags for some aspects of the Untended Graves, but not all of them, and we'll explore the potential significance of this a little bit later on.
Before we move on though, I'm going to leave a message here that says, huh? It's a, I can't take this. But if only I had a, you don't deserve this. <laughs> I wish more games had the absurdity of the Dark Souls messaging system. It really is tremendous. So without further ado, let's head to the actual untended graves an hour into the episode. So for reasons I'll explain a little bit later on, it has been a very long time since I have played Dark Souls 3, or really any Souls game for that matter. And I think, unfortunately, it really shows in my gameplay. So please accept my sincerest apologies in advance because I'm not nearly as skilled as I once was. And even back when I played Souls games all the time, I wasn't the most skilled player in the world. So the gameplay you're about to see is segmented in the sense that there will be a couple of edit points where I've cut out me just running back to the bonfire to get more flasks and so yeah I apologize that it's not one continuous clip of me playing just because I don't have those kinds of skills anymore but in any case moving on this right here is obviously not the place where we spawn in the cemetery of ash when we spawn in the Cemetery of Ash, we're actually spawning around the corner here, where we find several Corvians and a Corvian storyteller, who appears to be in the midst of a very fiery and passionate sermon. Not sure what the sermon is about, but in light of my diminished skills, we're going to use all the tools that we have at our disposal here to try and make this a little bit easier including these black firebombs, which actually worked a treat as far as uh, taking these friends out without getting them to aggro too quickly. Yeah, even still, that was... <laughs> that was a lot closer than it reasonably ought to have been. But once we take them all out, we pillage the remains of our own grave, seemingly, and we find an Ashen Estes ring. Grey Crystalline Ring, crafted from shards, increases FP restored by Ashen Estes Flask. Once a treasure brought before Lothric's queen, she had it enshrined in the Cemetery of Untended Graves, so that one day an unkindled might profit from its use. Enshrined meaning to place a revered or precious object in an appropriate receptacle or to preserve a right tradition or idea in a form that ensures it will be protected and respected. So that's really, really interesting. And if you zoom in on the ring itself, you can see that it is indeed crystalline. 
in the sense that uh, there are crystal shards sort of growing out of it in contrast to the normal Estes ring, which is not crystallized. So yeah, that's really interesting because <laughs> I don't know if a coffin is necessarily, like I guess it says an appropriate receptacle, but if it's a revered or precious object, then how is a grave an appropriate receptacle? I'm not entirely sure, but Lothric's queen seemed to think that this particular grave was a great spot for it. So we'll return to this a little bit later on with some ideas. So when we return to this fork in the road, so to speak, there's the bonfire back there, and we find a basin, or a bowl, whatever this thing is, where, again, in the Cemetery of Ash, there is an Astora Knight leaning up against the basin. In what I believe is the exact same pose in which we find Oscar of Astora in the Northern Undead Asylum in Dark Souls 1. And after he was smashed through the ceiling of the Northern Undead Asylum, he seemed kind of, kind of crestfallen. I don't know, maybe it's just because he was dying. But given that context, it seems appropriate that we would find a soul of a crestfallen knight here. And there's a spot not too far from the bowl here, which serves as the trigger which starts the Cathedral Grave Warden on their patrol, which, ouch, that one hurt a lot. Um, again, my sincerest apologies for the just dreadful quality of the gameplay here, as I try and fail to land a parry. and almost die to a trash mob, who drops a large Titanite shard. Very nice. So we can see another Cathedral Grave Warden right here, who is in the midst of their patrol, and who we've missed horribly. Nice dodge there, friend. And we actually landed a parry, wow. So as we mentioned earlier, their weapons inflict bleed, so you really don't want to get caught in one of their combos. Parrying can work if you're not dreadful at it, like I seem to be these days. Around the corner here we have one of these Star of Towns, who even though I knew it was there, it still sort of took me by surprise. Just in time with that firebomb. So we have an item shiny here, which is a Titanite chunk. And so we have several additional starved hounds in this pool over here, as well as another item shiny. And the item shiny is a Titanite chunk. I almost feel bad killing these doggos here because they were just sort of chilling and not really bothering anyone. Although I suppose it's possible they might have chased us had we passed a certain threshold. So in any case, let's go over here to the side.
in which we find, unlike in the Cemetery of Ash, not just one, but two ravenous crystal lizards. Thankfully though, we can use our bow to aggro them one at a time, so that's what we're gonna do. I know I've already said it in this episode, but I really do love the idea of the ravenous crystal lizards. I think it's just such a cool evolution of the idea of a crystal lizard. So now just one more to go. Dodge has paid off there big time. Well, rip friends, but thank you very kindly for the scales. So we're just going to run back to the bonfire real quick to replenish our Estus before proceeding onwards to our invader daughter of Crystal Krempheel. And she can be quite formidable because she can, of course, parry you. Except in this case, she got caught against these two gravestones here. And very conveniently just, yeah. Let us take her out. She didn't even aggro this friend here. So you can see just how pitch black it is here. And this is, of course, where the bonfire is in the Cemetery of Ash. So I've thought about for a while now what I was going to do with Swordmaster in this area and because I, I feel like to some degree summoning Swordmaster it, it does sort of break the boss fight with Champion Gunder so rather than summoning Swordmaster to help me deal with the boss I decided why don't we summon One friend just like plunged into the abyss. Oh my gosh, that was close. Yeah, that one friend was just, yeah, rip. So Swordmaster is going to help us deal with all of the Grave Wardens just outside the boss room as sort of a compromise. Because I do, as you all know, I do very much enjoy summoning the NPCs in this. But the Champion Gunder boss fight is really ruined the dual aspect of it if you summon assistance. So, yeah, it's just gonna be. It's just gonna be. Me and Gunder, and then we're going to use Swordmaster here to help us take out some of the enemies outside the boss fight. He's not taking well to his duties. It, seems though there you go and you can see that of course swordmaster is using the chaos blade <laughs> because every oh, come on swordmaster every time swordmaster lands a hit he takes damage 
And so the other option I was toying with was the possibility of having Swordmaster fight Champion Gunder by himself. Unfortunately, he doesn't last very long. I've tried it several times, and he just he can't do it. He might have been able to do it if it were just him versus Champion Gunder. Oh my gosh, come on, friend. If it, if it were just him and Champion Gunder fighting one-on-one -on -one and uh, Gunder didn't have the HP boost. But unfortunately, when you summon someone, he does get an HP boost. And, and so Swordmaster just, he can't last long enough. And so we've actually seen both of the drops from the Grave Wardens in that they drop a large soul of a deserted corpse as well as a cleric's chime. So it looks like that's everyone. And Swordmaster is... <laughs> I love that they never patched the social awkwardness of the NPC summons. How they always turn away from you after they've uh, rubber banded. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for your kind service, friend. I'm sorry that I don't need you for the boss fight, but take care. So that actually went much, much better than I was expecting it would. I was hoping that I still had a good sense of the timing on the parries in the first phase, and as it turned out, I did. And though I'm led to understand that you can parry Gunder in the second phase, I've never really been able to get the hang of it, so I didn't even try here. <laughs> Before we talk about Gunder, we actually missed a very important item description just prior to the boss fight, that of the hidden blessing, holy water, blessed by the Queen of Lothric. 
fully restores FP. There is a grave in Lothric that sees no visitors, a dark place where rootless warriors rest. The Queen of Lothric alone cared to wish the poor souls good fortune. Rootless meaning, as an adjective, of a plant not having roots, or more generally having no settled home or social or family ties. So again, very consistent with what we were discussing earlier, that these are people who, in the absence of any sort of settled home or social or family ties, they don't have anyone to mourn them, they don't have anyone to uh, set flowers down on their grave or whatever the equivalent is in this world. Um, they are rootless warriors. So in other words, this is a graveyard for soldiers without families, or at least without a family name that matters. This is, to put it a bit more crudely, a graveyard for nobodies. It follows from this that this is a graveyard which sees very few visitors. Interestingly, however, the Queen of Lothric, whomever she happens to be, and obviously that's a matter of some contention and controversy, and, and we'll discuss that not in this episode, but at a much later date. <laughs> But whomever the Queen of Lothric happens to be, and for whatever reason, she has taken it upon herself to visit these graves and thereby to pay her respects to the countless nameless soldiers that are buried here. This is not the first time we've come across a hidden blessing, of course, though I don't remember which episode it would have been in which we first read this item description. Up to this point, however, we've not come across this item out in the world, only in the inventory of merchants in Firelink Shrine, as Grey Rat will sell one after he pillages Irithil, and the Shrine Handmaid will sell one after she's given the Dream Chaser's ashes, which we have not yet given her. In fact, it won't be until we reach the Ringed City that we'll come across another hidden blessing out in the world. So it wasn't until I actually looked at the locations of all the different hidden blessings in the game that I realized that these items out in the world are actually quite rare. So it's rather significant, I think, that the Queen of Lothric, who is obviously a very, very important person, would leave this item here. of the champion Gunder. Once, a champion came late to the festivities and was greeted by a shrine without fire and a bell that would not toll. Festivity meaning as a noun, the celebration of something in a joyful and exuberant way, activities or events celebrating a special occasion. So I'm wondering if festivities is even the right word here. Perhaps whatever ceremonies were involved in the institution of linking the fire prior to Gunder's failure to do so. Because I don't think that Gunder is an ashen one in the same way that the player character is an ashen one. And we've discussed this in episodes past, the idea that the Ashen Ones didn't actually start to arise until A, the Lords of Cinder started refusing to return to their thrones when the bell tolled, and B, when the likes of Gunder no longer proved capable of facilitating the linking of the fire, then something needed to be done, and that something is you turn to the Ashen Ones. So these people who are themselves collectives rise from the ashes in the untended graves, and yeah, I guess we need to get into the cosmology of the untended graves in relation to the Cemetery of Ash and Firelink Shrine in order to actually have what I just said make any sort of sense. So let's proceed with that, shall we? According to Yosuho, in Japanese, the text of this item simply reads, a hero that arrived late and was greeted by a shrine without fire and a bell that would not toll. So the only source I can find, Yosuho writes, for the word festivities from the original text is Google Translate, was this celebrated its late 
has been a hero in the ritual field without fire. That was a bell that does not ring. It is a mistranslation, which means is is a very... <laughs> So Yosaho goes on to write, did whoever translated this even know Japanese at all? So apparently this is not a very good translation. And I I apologize, Yosaho, for having subjected you to such awful Japanese for the purposes of this show. My apologies. I hope it wasn't too frustrating doing all this. So if we bring Gunder's soul to Ludlith, we can, as always, get one of two items. The first being Gunder's halberd. Halberd of Gunder, the champion, received when he was charged with his duty. This old cast iron halberd has the power to break poise and is said to never crumble, seeming to suggest that Gunder was fated to eternal service from the beginning. Skill champion's charge. Hold spear at waist and charge at foe and use momentum to transition into sweeping strong attack. So if you rewind a couple minutes, you'll notice that that move, that special skill is essentially what Gunder used repeatedly to take my health away. So yeah, that's an apt special skill because for many players, I imagine that that particular skill was their kryptonite, so to speak, when facing the boss. So the second item actually builds on this last line in the middle paragraph of Gunder's Halberd, where it says that Gunder was fated to eternal service from the beginning, because the second item is a ring called Prisoner's Chain, portion of a steel chain used to restrain Gunder. Gain vigor, endurance, and vitality, but take extra damage. A prisoner is one who has staked everything on a belief, a proclivity most apparent in the greatest of champions. So this seems to offer an explanation for Gunder's tardiness, for why he was late to the festivities or the ceremony involved in linking the fire, because he was restrained by someone. But interestingly, it's not 100% clear whether this chain is in reference to the reason he was late or the fact that because he was late, he became subject to imprisonment as a champion, as a Udex, and became forced to sort of live out his life based on the shame that he allowed the fire to go out. And that because of that, he committed himself, as we'll learn in a moment, to becoming a scabbard. So the prisoner's chain could be interpreted in a number of different ways. I think the most likely and most obvious explanation is that someone had Gunder imprisoned and that that's why Gunder did not make it on time. Who had him imprisoned, I suppose, is an open question. I don't know whether there's any actual evidence for this in the text of the game itself. But if we think about the various parties and their motivations, you can come up with a couple of very obvious yet speculative possibilities. The first and perhaps most obvious being Aldrich, Sullivan, and their cronies, because of course Aldrich wants to usher in an age of the deep sea. Aldrich doesn't want the age of fire to continue. And also maybe Aldrich thought that Gunder looked especially tasty. So so maybe Aldrich had him locked up for that reason. I laugh, but really that's a distinct possibility. And I guess it just goes to show how dark the whole thing is. Um, because yeah, as we'll see in a moment, when you look at Gunder's helmet, it's actually covered in blood. So whatever happened when he was imprisoned, it could not have been good. The second possibility I was going to point to is Yuria and her crew of Londor Hollows. And my reasoning for that would have been that, of course, their mission is to usurp the flame. But in that context, now that I think about it a little bit more, I'm not sure that they would want Gunder to be late. Because if they're usurping the flame, I'd, <laughs> the physics and the cosmology of it is not entirely clear. So is it a Dragon Ball Z type situation where 
if you are usurping the flame, you want it to get as close as possible to being extinguished before rekindling it, and then thereby improving the strength of the flame, sort of like in Dragon Ball Z when a Saiyan, it's absurd even just saying it out loud, but when a Saiyan gets closer to death and then they heal themselves, it, it sort of improves their power, raises their power level. So is it a situation like that with the first flame where you allow it to get very close to extinguishment and then you rekindle it and it becomes more kindled? Or is it much more straightforward, you don't want it to get anywhere near extinguishing and you just want to rekindle it right away? I assume it's the latter and not the former, but if the former is the case, then you could make an argument that uh, it was Londor Hollows, someone serving Londor interests who imprisoned Gunder, so as to prepare the flame for a usurping later on. But I think it's more likely now that I've talked it through to myself and to all of you that it could not have been them because provided that you want to keep the flame healthy if you're going to usurp it later, then yeah, you probably wouldn't want Gunder to be imprisoned because that would put in jeopardy the flame that you're intending to usurp later on. So I'd be very interested if any of you have any ideas about this because I'm just talking in circles at this point, so I'm gonna move on. Proclivity meaning, as a noun, a tendency to choose or do something regularly, an inclination or predisposition towards a particular thing. So in other words, Gunder's proclivity, his inclination to stake everything, to put everything on the line for the sake of his belief, which presumably is that the institution of linking the fire is worth serving, that it's worth perpetuating the age of fire, that it's worth continuing to link the fire despite the apparent signs that continuing over and over again to link the fire is not only proving to be less and less effective over time, it's also having adverse side effects on the world, it's producing adverse side effects on the world in a way that, yeah, we see throughout the game that things are not right with this world and its inhabitants. But the mechanics of this ring reflect the story in a very interesting way, in the sense that this ring gives you more vigor, endurance, and vitality. So Gunder, as a prisoner, because of this proclivity to stake everything on his belief in the institution of linking the fire, he had the power, because of this belief, to endure it gave him extra vigor, it gave him extra vitality, but as a result of that belief, he took more damage, which is to say he subjected himself to pain, suffering, all for the sake of this belief, but that belief gave him the ability to endure. So yeah, I think that's very, very interesting. So when we return to Firelink Shrine and speak with the Shrine Handmaid, she will have Gunder's set available for purchase, including Gunder's helm, ancient helm of a set of cast iron armor belonging to Champion Gunder. Modeled after a former king, Gunder or the belated champion was bested by an unknown warrior. He then became sheathed to a coiled sword in the hopes that someday the first flame would be linked once more. Champion meaning as a noun, first, a person who has defeated or surpassed all rivals in a competition, especially in sports. Second, a person who fights or argues for a cause or on behalf of someone else. And historically, a knight who fought in single combat on behalf of the monarch. As a verb to support the cause of or defend. So as a noun, obviously, the one we're looking for is the second one, but the historical definition works as well. So the second one being a person who fights or argues for a cause or on behalf of someone else. And in a historical setting, a knight who fought in single combat on behalf of the monarch. So of course, Champion Gunder is ultimately fighting for the monarch insofar as the monarch is in favor of the institution of 
continually, perpetually linking the fire. And so Gundrib fights for the monarch, but also for the cause of linking the fire. And I guess it's principally for the cause and that the monarch is just a secondary product of that, but I digress. And as a verb, you could also say that Champion Gunder championed linking the fire, so much so that he devoted his life to it and for some reason was also in prison for it and endured nevertheless. Sheath meaning as a noun, a cover for the blade of a knife or sword a structure in living tissue which closely envelops another, a protective covering around an electric cable, a woman's close-fitting dress, or <laughs> British <laughs> economy. I was not aware of that last definition. So the one we're looking for here is obviously a cover for the blade of a knife or a sword. This is sort of an interesting take on the idea of the sword in the stone, that in searching for some chosen knight, there's a sword in a stone that only the chosen knight can take out and use, that no one else will be able to remove the sword from the stone other than the chosen knight. And in this case, of course, simply removing the sword from the stone is not sufficient. You have to actually remove the sword from the stone and then use the sword to slay the stone. But it is, I think, a very interesting take on, I want to say that that's a King Arthur thing. As a kid, I just loved the idea of the sword in the stone. I, I don't recall much more of the specifics around it. So Gunder is not exactly a sheath. Like it works as a word, but you know, he's sort of like a mobile or an organic stone in the sword in the stone legend. So longtime viewers of this series, which I'll remind you started back in 2016, <laughs> uh, will remember perhaps that Udex was our first ever fun with definitions. And yeah, that was all the way back in the first episode of this series when I was pronouncing this word as Iudex and not just Udex. So yeah, Udex meaning in the Roman civil process with its division into two stages before the magistrate and before the judge, the Udex was a private person taken from the higher social classes who was appointed to conduct the hearing in the second stage. No special legal knowledge was required. The choice of the judge lay with the parties and was normally, but not necessarily, made from a panel of qualified persons. The party's choice was approved by the magistrate before whom the proceedings in Ur were conducted. The Udex could not refuse the commission conferred on him by the magistrate's orders to hear the case, except on recognized grounds. So Gunder, as a Udex, was not able to refuse his appointment, which is an interesting point, but ultimately I think a moot point, given the fact that as we just learned, Gunder was 100% devoted to the cause, such that he never would have refused the assignment anyway. That's very interesting, and I assume that I talked about this at great length in the first episode, so I'm not going to recapitulate that entire discussion here. But yeah, interesting that we've sort of come full circle almost. And uh, yeah, it's been four years since we first started drawing the circle. So again, thank you all very, very much for sticking with me for all this time. I really, really do appreciate it. So to reiterate what I said at the beginning of the episode, my original plan was to have Cassidy on the show for this area so that we could discuss in greater detail the wonderful essay she wrote about this area, and so that she might speak a little bit to how, whether, or to what extent she sees things differently now, several years later with the benefit of hindsight afforded by both DLCs. Unfortunately, because I've been quarantining with my fiance and we share a relatively small apartment with no walls or doors separating our respective workspaces, I haven't been able to set aside the kind of time needed to record with the guests since the start of the pandemic. 
So I've had to record this episode in bits and pieces, weeks and months apart, whenever the opportunity has presented itself. In fact, I started recording this episode in early June and it is now November 21st, 2020, and I'm still working on this episode. In this context, it just wasn't possible to have guests on because frankly, it would not have been fair to them, it wouldn't have been fair to me to expect us to record under those sorts of conditions. So unfortunately, I don't have Cassidy here to discuss this essay with me, but I will of course have her on at a later date. And in the meantime, I've put together something that I think is pretty special in terms of the reading for this essay. So again, I would recommend reading the entire essay in full for yourself, a link to which will be found in the video description below. Because I'm not going to be reading the entire thing, I'm going to be leaving bits and pieces out. Um, an entire segment, of course, uh, the introductory segment, I'm going to be leaving out entirely. So this isn't the complete picture that Cassidy paints, but it's a partial portrait of what I think is a very interesting and provocative picture that she wrote all the way back in 2016, and I hope you enjoy this particular rendition of it. champion is not a champion without a firekeeper. A firekeeper is nothing without a flame, the soul of a champion, to tend. Nowhere is this more illustrated than in the story of the champion and judge, Gunder, and his firekeeper. Once upon a time, the fire, the soul of the world, was fading. As always, when that happens, champions and their firekeepers rise. Gunder was one such champion. It is unknown why he was late to the festivities. His firekeeper was not. And she arrived at the Ashen Fireling Shrine to wait. And wait. And wait. Like all firekeepers, before and since. But Gunder arrived too late. The fire of reality had already gone out, and the bells, warning of the fire's demise, had stopped. The firekeeper waited in vain, and died, and was buried, or rather discarded, with her sisters in the tower. It is a story so well known that the masses know it, favor it. However, this also leads to a possible conclusion of why the monarchy of Lothric tries so hard to protect the untended graves. It is perhaps because it reveals a terrible secret. The world is already in an age of dark. The apocalypse has already come and gone. In a way, this might explain the dark sign in the sky. The world is branded by the dark sign, and is itself undead, purely because of inaction by the time our Ashen One rises. A terrible, tragic farce. The idea of purgatory is older than Christianity itself, stretching back to the practices of caring and praying for the dead. In the 12th century, Purgatory became thought of as a literal place, a place for purification before moving on in the afterlife. St. Ambrose of Milan put forth the idea, for instance, that purgatory was a baptism in fire at the entrance to heaven.
Purgatory in Dante's interpretation is an island and a terraced mountain, unchained by reality or any other landmass. Each terrace is a different vice to overcome on their way to heaven. The Nexus-esque layout of the Firelink Shrine of Dark Souls 3 is very similar to this terraced description of Dante's Purgatory. In essence, the ashen Firelink Shrine that we call home is Purgatory, a grey ashen place caught between the light and the dark where you and others, like Andre, the Shrine Handmaid, and especially the Firekeeper, are bound by the curse of the Shrine to serve the institution of the fire. This explains why the Ashen Firelink Shrine serves as a waypoint or a convergence point for different characters, as different characters who have their own worlds visit and rest here as well. This may also explain why Firelink Shrine can be accessed from any bonfire in the game and isn't connected to any real place within the game world, unlike the Untended Shrine. Purification for our Ashen One comes in the form of conflict and violence on their journey to bring the Lords of Cinder back to their thrones. Once the journey is complete, and all of the Lords of Cinder have been brought back, the Firekeeper anoints the Ashen One, allowing them to make the final ascent to the paradise of the world, the Kiln of the First Flame. So Cassidy makes some very interesting arguments in this essay, which again, I've only just read in part. So if you found it interesting, I would highly recommend reading the entire thing for yourself by following the link provided in the video description below. And again, though I'm not sure if she still believes this or not, perhaps the most intriguing claim Cassidy makes is that the Ashen Firelink Shrine, which serves as a hub area for us as well as for a number of NPCs, is actually a sort of purgatory. I don't know that I agree with this specific suggestion, that it's purgatory in particular, but I certainly agree with her broader assertion that the Ashen Firelink Shrine exists in a Dreamlands-esque realm where the untended graves more closely reflects that which might be described as, and I have scare quotes around this in my notes here, reality. This raises an additional question, of course. That being, if the untended graves reveals the world as it is, a world shrouded in darkness after the flame has faded, then what the heck is the kiln of the first flame? Is the Ashen Firelink Shrine a dreamland within a dreamland? The real world, again with scare quotes around it, in this context exists along a continuum of sorts, or does it? This is a question we're going to have to explore in greater detail a little bit later on because it's already doing my head in and I just finished a doctoral thesis, so you'd think I'd be equipped to handle this, but I'm clearly not. Cassidy also argues in this essay that Kremhild, an agent of the Crown, invades in the Untended Graves because she is protecting state secrets and serving the interests of the Kingdom of Lothric. Unkindled ones may be less inclined to serve the institution of linking the fire if they had a better sense of how far this institution has fallen and how faded the flame has become. 
So maybe for the likes of Gunder, the people who cling so firmly to their belief in the good of linking the fire, the necessity of linking the fire, that they might not be able to endure if they saw how bad things have become. So of course, Gunder endured what seems like an awful, dreadful imprisonment. And again, now that I'm thinking about it more and more, I'm thinking that the most likely place where Gunder would have been imprisoned is the Irithyll dungeon, which I think makes sense, because um, I don't know that we know of any other places where prisoners are really kept in the game world. None that I can think of off the top of my head anyway. I wanted to share an alternative explanation via this comment from Sir Paradigm, who offers a different take on Gunder based on a different interpretation of the temporal relationship between the untended graves and the ashen Firelink Shrine. There are two major things that draw my attention regarding Udex Gunder. The first and most obvious is the massive pus of man that has grown within him. The second, however, is more easily overlooked. And that is that Udex Gunder is one of only two bosses in the game that does not drop a soul upon death, the other being the Ancient Wyvern. I say this is easily overlooked because we receive the coiled sword upon victory, leading most to assume that the soul reward was simply replaced by a key item for gameplay reasons. I however have another theory, and this draws from three main things. Firstly, Aegon's previous discussion regarding the distortion of time due to the first flame. Secondly, the existence of the untended graves. And thirdly, the presence of the pus of man specifically the ones residing within the Lothric Wyverns. Essentially, I believe that the reason we do not get a soul from defeating the Udex is because that soul has already been claimed in our past slash future battle with the champion. If we consider the possibility that the Untended Graves is the Firelink we know simply in the past, as evidenced by the Handmaid recognizing us, then upon defeating Champion Gunder and claiming his soul, we are leaving nothing for our future slash past self to claim. But this raises another question. If Champion Gunder is past Udex and we killed him, how is it we are fighting him in the beginning of the game? And I believe the answer to that lies with the Puss of Man. Consider the possibility that the Puss of Man was a byproduct of experimentation by Oseros in his attempt to transform into a dragon. Judging by its serpent-like appearance, the Soul series' history of treating serpents as incomplete dragons and the fact that they are abundant within the Consumed King's Garden, then their presence throughout Lothric would make a lot of sense, mainly because it seems the pus is able to draw upon its host's potential. The hollow form may simply shamble and attack recklessly as hollows tend to do, but in the case of the wyverns, the pus seems to be able to not only utilize the wyvern's fire breath, but also perform complex functions such as flight. And I do believe the pus is responsible for these actions as a single well-placed strike to it will cause the wyvern to go limp. And were the pus a simple parasite, you would think removing it would aid rather than kill the host. If this is true, then the pus of man seen around Lothric may be an attempt to weaponize Osiris's byproducts, turning normal hollows into fierce enemies, and even reanimating dead wyverns to fight once more. So basically, our battle with Udex is not with Gunder at all. A worthy champion was needed for the linking of the fire, and a judge was required to test his worth. Who better to test a champion than another champion? Gunder was a prime candidate, but was unfortunately dead. But rather than simply let his potential die, it seems someone or something chose another way. And so Gunder's corpse became host to the pus of man and lay dormant until such a time as it was challenged by a worthy champion. The pus, able to utilize Gunder's strength and talent, albeit to a lesser degree, proved an adequate judge. In short, I believe that the Udex Gunder we battle is actually a puppet corpse. 
controlled by the pus of man, as the original died in the untended graves. It seems the path to linking the fire is a cursed one, indeed. So once again, I love this idea, and I think it's really interesting and rather well supported on the basis of the evidence presented here and the reasoning presented here by Sir Paradigm. Again, I don't know that I agree with the specific suggestion, only because I'm a little bit unclear on the temporality of everything. And of course, time is convoluted, worlds phase in and out, but this argument, if I'm understanding it correctly, is contingent upon the idea that the untended graves is the past, and that by traveling from the Ashen Firelink Shrine to the untended graves, we are traveling from the present into the past. When I think the relationship between the untended graves and the Ashen Firelink Shrine is actually a bit more complicated than that, in the sense that it's not a simple past and future relationship. But aside from that, I, I love the idea of the pus of man being this parasitic force that is a byproduct of Osiris's experimentation in trying to become a dragon. Because again, as Sir Paradigm notes, these serpents are throughout the Dark Souls series associated with imperfect dragons. So I really like this idea, even if I don't know that I agree with the specific interpretation that suggests, again, if I'm understanding Sir Paradigm correctly, that the Untended Graves is the past relative to the Ashen Firelink Shrine, which is the present. Um, I think that they're more like different universes, that the Untended Graves is sort of a bubble universe that was created in a Dreamlands-esque sort of realm, in a manner not unlike the Hunter's Dream in Bloodborne. And the question of who created these realms is another matter entirely. Undoubtedly, it's someone who has an interest in ensuring that the fire is continually linked that it's linked in perpetuity, and that you produce as many Ashen Ones as is possible, because the more of them you produce, and this is reflected in the reality of the game itself as well, the more copies of the game you sell, the more times the flame will be linked. Because of course, not everyone that starts the game will finish it. In fact, I imagine it's a startlingly low percentage uh, I seem to recall in Bloodborne, when I last looked it up in terms of the trophies, it was something like 10%, if not less. I'd be very curious to see what percentage of people actually linked the flame in this game, which is not something I've looked up, but I imagine will be on the screen now. Um, and look at that percentage, it's very small, as I suggested. Um, but yeah, I, I do like this idea, even if I don't agree with the specifics of it, because I have in mind what I guess is a more complicated cosmology, which wouldn't just mean that the untended graves is the past to the present or the future of the Ashen Firelink Shrine. As always though, I'd be very interested in hearing if any of you out there have any alternative explanations or whether you'd like to add onto or refute some element of Sir Paradigm or Cassidy's explanation for what's going on here. I'd be very interested in hearing all about it, so don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below. So before we move on, let's grab the Black Knight Glaive over here in the corner, the description for which is identical to the other Black Knight weapons which we read earlier, so I'm not going to recapitulate those. But as to why this is here, I'm not entirely sure. 
Maybe it's here to clue you into the fact that there are black knights here. Maybe this is supposed to suggest that Champion Gunder killed the black knight. I'm not entirely sure. Interestingly though, if you fight the Dancer of the Boreal Valley, Consumed King Osiris and Champion Gunder before going to Farron Keep, this would be your first encounter with the Black Knights of Dark Souls 3. I don't know if they would actually foreshadow a first encounter which occurs under such a specific set of circumstances, but that is definitely another possibility. It's also possible that this is simply a vestige of this scrapped time of day system, and that maybe you were supposed to find this after fighting some form of Gunder, which shifted the time of day to night and spawned this item, but I really don't know. I suspect that I'm probably just overthinking this, as with 99% of things in this series, and that this item is solely here because there are no Glaive or Halberd Black Knights in Dark Souls 3, or at least I don't seem to recall there being any. In which case, this is here so that players can get their hands on this weapon. As always though, I'd love to hear other ideas, so if you have one, please share it in the comments section below. Let's proceed through this door here so that we might explore the rest of the area. And almost right away we're confronted with a number of additional examples of the curiously inconsistent mechanical relationship between the Firelink Shrine on the one hand and the Untended Graves on the other. When we bring up the menu for instance, we find that this door is actually the border between Cemetery of Ash and Firelink Shrine. So again, this area does not have unique flags for the area name as far as the game's save files are concerned. And when we step away from the door, we find the soapsome message that we left earlier. In the Ashen Firelink Shrine, of course, this area is guarded by a bunch of Grave Wardens, nothing really too difficult other than Swordmaster, I suppose. But of course, in this area, we have four Black Knights, three of whom are stationary until they're aggroed, while the fourth roams the area as you approach. So let's aggro this stationary Black Knight with an arrow so that we don't have to deal with two Black Knights at once because if we rush headlong at this friend, then the one that roams with the Greatsword would be, yeah, we'd be in trouble. Oh, speaking of trouble. Okay, that was a lot closer than it reasonably ought to have been. And the reason I guess I should point out that it sounds like I'm doing live commentary even though I'm clearly doing post commentary is that it's been months since I recorded this footage so I legitimately don't really know what's coming next other than I need to comment over this footage so here we are. And as I mentioned when we approach the Black Knight here starts doing his rounds until he sees us. Again, not off to a great start. Old habits die hard as far as parrying is concerned, obviously. Ouch. So if you thought that my having segmented the gameplay meant that I would be cutting out embarrassing deaths, uh, that one was for you. We fared a little bit better that time. But again, I have to apologize for the truly dreadful gameplay. I've played this game so infrequently in the last two years that I'm just awful at it now. And I also don't think I ever truly adjusted my gameplay style to John Grimm's Reaper weapon, which requires us to sort of keep at a distance from the enemies, which, <sighs> ouch, is in a way antithetical to my play style as Aegon and the types of weapons that I normally use. So hopefully Aegon will get over his hollowing at some point between now and the end of the playthrough so we can go back to using weapons I'm not terrible with.
now, with that Black Knight out of the way, the smart thing to do would be to take out the Greatsword Black Knight over on the left so that we can sneak behind the fourth and final Black Knight who is guarding an item at a grave over here on the right. But for some reason I just didn't do that here. After we take him out, we find that the item he was guarding is the Hornet Ring, ring associated with the Lord's Blade Karen, one of the four knights of Gwyn, the first lord, boosts critical attacks. The masked Karen was the only woman to serve in Gwyn's four knights, and her curved sword granted a swift death to any and all enemies of the throne. As we discussed in an earlier episode, it seems likely that the Abyss Watchers were trained by Lord's Blade Karen, who served as one of Lord Gwyn's four elite knights, along with Knight Artorius, Hawkeye Go, and Dragon Slayer Ornstein. Though the precise nature of their relationship is not entirely clear, Lord's Blade Karen appears at a minimum to have cared deeply for Artorius. Prior to the Artorius of the Abyss expansion to Dark Souls 1, players were only made aware of Karen by reading the description for the Hornet Ring, which, in that game, was found behind what was ostensibly the grave of Artorius in the Darkroot Forest. When the DLC was released, however, we discovered that this spot was once called the Ulysil Sanctuary, and that Artorius had not actually died there. Artorius died at the hands of the Chosen Undead, a fair distance from this spot, in a large coliseum, which I want to say is in an area we can't actually access in the Darkroot Wood of the base game, but I could be remembering that incorrectly. After Artorius dies in this spot, we find Lord's Blade Karen here, paying her respects at a makeshift grave that she evidently threw together, consisting only of a tassel and a very basic gravestone. It's actually kind of sad. So why does any of this matter? This is significant because we just found the Hornet Ring at the gravestone which corresponds to the one in the Ashen Firelink Shrine, where we found Hawkwood's shield in the previous episode, where Hawkwood was himself praying. Hawkwood's shield is, of course, a symbol of his failure as a member of the Undead Legion, given that they do not make use of shields. Interestingly, however, Artorius did use a shield, but that's not something the player ever witnesses, as we only ever encounter him after he's left the shield in the Abyss. Lord's Blade Karen, on the other hand, does not use a shield, and instead wields a gold tracer in her right hand and a silver tracer in her left. So the Undead Legion thinks they're paying homage to Artorius by refusing to use shields, but that's actually a lie, like so many other things in this world. This is consistent with the theme of this area more generally, as this place contains all manner of secrets that, if they were more widely known, would surely rock the foundations of the Society of Lothric. The legend of Artorius is that of an abyss walker, but in actual fact, he succumbed to the abyss. And even though it's made apparent in Dark Souls 1 that Dusk of Ulysil is principally responsible for perpetuating this false legend, this makes it clear that Lord's Blade Karen also played a major role in fabricating this particular historical narrative. Now, before we enter the Untended Shrine, let's head over to the opposite side of the entrance to grab the Chaos Blade. And on the way there, we find the fourth and final Black Knight, who will ambush you from behind if you're not paying attention. Over here we have a Soul of a Crestfallen Knight. 
and not much else. But you can see over here, uh, yeah, this would have been the ideal way of dealing with the Black Knight who was guarding the Hornet Ring. So then that way you could have snuck up behind and got a free backstab, but yeah. So after dispatching that Black Knight, we find the Chaos Blade. A cursed sword of unknown origin, bearing uncanny streaks on its blade. Attacks also damage its wielder. The sword is not unlike a thing misshapen, granted life, but never welcome in this world. In other words, chaos itself. Uncanny meaning strange or mysterious, especially in an unsettling way. So there's something about the streaks on the Chaos Blade, which is unsettling, apparently much like Chaos itself. And interestingly, it's probably not a coincidence that this word has its origin in a late 16th century term, which originally meant relating to the occult or something malicious. So given that the chaos emerged from the experiments of the Daughters of Chaos and the Witch of Isleth, that makes sense. Chaos as a noun, we have a few definitions here, beginning with complete disorder and confusion. In physics, it means behavior so unpredictable as to appear random, owing to great sensitivity to small changes in conditions, the formless matter supposed to have existed before the creation of the universe. And in Greek mythology, the first created being from which came the primeval deities Gaia, Tartarus, Erebus, and Nyx. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm not entirely sure why this is here and not say in the smoldering lake or another area more directly associated with chaos. I'm also not entirely clear on what the deal is with Swordmaster more generally. So if you have any ideas about either of those things, don't hesitate to let me know in the comment section below. What I will say is that as we discussed in the previous episode, the Wood Rain Ring plus one is found in the Consumed King's Garden in New Game Plus. So, even though it's most likely I suspect that this particular ring belonged to one of the Eastern Assassins dispatched to Lothric to commit regicide by killing Oseros, as we discussed in that episode, I think it's also possible that this person may have been searching for the Chaos Blade, much like Shiva was in Dark Souls 1. But yeah, that's the best I could come up with for now, so I'd be interested in hearing if anyone has any other ideas. So it's finally time for us to enter the untended shrine. And right away, it's a rather eerie and uncomfortable sight in contrast to the Ashen Shrine, which is obviously very well lit. And you can hear, even in the soundscape, you can hear that this place is more or less empty. Whereas Firelink, there's activity, at least in the form of Andre's hammer, constantly hammering away at some short sword. But yeah, here there's nothing. Before we explore the shrine itself, let's head outside to the giant tree. And when we examine it, we find a giant seed. Now, as was noted earlier, had I not taken this seed and warped back to the ashen shrine and checked that giant tree, I'd have found a seed there instead. And upon subsequently returning here, I would have found nothing. Having taken the seed just now, however, when we return to the ashen shrine later in this episode, we will find that the giant tree does not have a seed. In mechanical terms, in other words, this is because these two giant trees are actually the same tree. In terms of the lore, however, I think this suggests that these trees are linked to one another by way of some affinity, which is a concept we will return to shortly, so I want everyone to keep that in mind for now. Now, because we can't actually interact with the door to the decrepit tower, which leads to the bell tower above and the mass grave of firekeepers below, there's no way for us to assess what is different in those areas. Or is there? Well, kind of? 
While we can't access all of the areas opened up by the tower key, we can use this tree over here to access the shrine's rafters, where in the Ashen Shrine, we find a chest containing the silver serpent ring. A silver ring depicting a snake that could have been, but never was, a dragon. Fallen foes yield more souls. Snakes are known as creatures of great avarice, devouring prey even larger than themselves by swallowing them whole. If one's shackles are cause for discontent, perhaps it is time for some old-fashioned greed. So this is reminiscent of a problem we discussed in Bloodborne Let's Talk Lore with respect to Yosefka's clinic. That is, for a short period of time following the release of Bloodborne, it was possible to hop over a fence in central Yarnum, permitting access to Yosefka's clinic long before the developers actually intended for players to be able to access the area. So this raised an interesting question concerning the half-transformed celestial in the clinic. That is, does the presence of this half-transformed celestial at the very start of the game indicate that the original Yosefka was in fact responsible for conducting horrifying experiments on human subjects without their informed consent? Or does this mean that because the developers did not intend for players to have access to Yosefka's clinic prior to her displacement at the hands of imposter Yosefka, they simply did not bother to create two different versions of this room, one without the Celestial for the period of time during which the original Yosefka was presiding over the clinic, and one with the Celestial for after imposter Yosefka takes over. The most likely answer, I think, is that FromSoft simply didn't bother making two versions of the clinic's interior because they had no intent for players to access the interior prior to the Yosefka switch. After all, they did patch the fence jump shortly thereafter, restricting early game access to the clinic's interior once more. In this case, however, they did not, or perhaps could not, patch this particular jump, adding to the questions we raised earlier in the episode about the inconsistency consistent differences in the flags between the untended and ashen shrines. Unfortunately, John Grimm is, like myself, rather rusty, so this proved to be a lot more difficult than originally anticipated. So after many, many, many failed attempts, John Grimm decided to shed some weight to make the jump easier, leading to this uh, rather unfortunate face reveal. I mean, you're beautiful, John Grimm. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise, but wow. Um, and eventually, that actually did the trick. Fittingly, the soapstone message over here reads, I did it! So that's definitely worthy of an upvote. So let's give John Grimm a second to put his clothes back on so that we can head inside where we find that neither Pickle P nor Pumperum are here to trade items with us or to squawk at us for just standing near their nest. We also find once again that messages left in the Ashen Shrine are present here in the Untended Shrine, including this message here, which to be frank, I don't even remember writing, but it reads, illusory wall ahead and then visions of ring. So there's no illusory wall here because I evidently shattered that illusion back in the Ashen Shrine before looting the chest here. This was all off camera, of course, because you may recall that it was actually Aegon and not John Grimm with whom we started this playthrough. As Aegon, we intentionally left this chest undisturbed in anticipation of this very moment. At that point in time, I hadn't anticipated that Aegon would be hollow, so instead we just have an empty chest here. This chest is shared between the untended and ashen shrines, which could be significant, but it's hard to say given the fact that we had to glitch our way here. But they didn't patch it, so that could be evidence in favor of that suggestion, I'm not entirely sure. But in any case, let's hop down so that we can finish up here and head back to the ashen shrine, because this place is so dark, it's giving me the heebie-jeebies. In the center of the untended shrine, we find not a bonfire, but an item shiny. This is consistent with what I said earlier about Gunder being a different sort of chosen undead than the Ashen One. 
Whereas the Ashen One emerges with the aim of proving herself worthy by defeating the Judge of Ash to claim a coiled sword with which to light the Shrine Bonfire, Champion Gunder was presumably already powerful enough or close to it to link the flame and perpetuate the Age of Fire. Gunder didn't need to prove himself worthy of a coiled sword. His shrine was already lit and his Firekeeper was already waiting. By contrast, the Firekeeper to which the Ashen One is bonded is not one with whom we had a pre-existing relationship. Our Firekeeper was tasked with serving whomever happens to defeat the Judge of Ash. This bond only becomes official when the Ashen One plunges the Coiled Sword into the center of the shrine, lighting the bonfire. Gunder's bonfire, this bonfire, was already lit, but it eventually petered out because of Gunder's imprisonment, leaving only this item shiny in its place, which contains a Coiled Sword fragment. Fragment of the Coiled Sword of a bonfire, which served its purpose long ago returns Caster to last bonfire used for resting, or to the bonfire in Firelink Shrine, can be used repeatedly. Bonfires are linked to one another irreversibly, retaining their affinity long after their purpose is exhausted. Affinity meaning, as a noun, a spontaneous or natural liking or sympathy for someone or something, a similarity of characteristics suggesting a relationship, especially a resemblance in structure between animals, plants, or languages, Relationship especially by marriage as opposed to blood ties. And in biochemistry, the degree to which a substance tends to combine with another. So to some degree, I would suggest that all of these are valid. There is something about the coiled sword in a bonfire which gives it a natural liking or connection with another bonfire. That there's something about the characteristics, a similarity of characteristics from one bonfire to the next, which suggests a relationship, some resemblance and structure between them, which permits the chosen undead or the ashen one to warp from one to the next. And there's a relationship between the different bonfires, which it's not marriage or blood ties which ties them together, it's something else entirely, presumably anyway. Um, I guess the only one that really isn't 100% relevant would be the biochemistry definition, the degree to which a substance tends to combine with another. Although I suppose you could make a case for that one as well, because there's something about the substance or, or the combination of substances in a bonfire which lends it to having a connection to another bonfire such that things and people can warp between them, which brings them not only to different points in space, but also different points in time. And I would argue, or I will argue shortly, to completely different and separate dimensions. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll get into that shortly. But first, we have to talk about the Untended Shrine Handmaid, which is something I've been dreading because trying to make sense of her place in the world and her connection to the Ashen Shrine Handmaid has always confused me. And so I'm sure that in offering an explanation for all of this, there's going to be some holes in it. Um, there's bound to be holes because I don't think you can come up with a single explanation that has no holes in it, um, that is essentially seamless and, and without flaw because that's just not how the stories in this game are designed and, and crafted. But yeah, here goes nothing anyway. So. The Shrine Handmaid not only uses what appears to be an identical character model to the Ashen Handmaid, she is also played by the exact same voice actor. More confusing still is the fact that a portion of her inventory, not all of her inventory, but a portion of her inventory is shared with that of the Ashen Handmaid. The Untended Shrine Handmaid does have items that the Ashen Shrine Handmaid does not, and vice versa, and we'll discuss those items in a minute, but say, if you purchase the Tower Key from the Ashen Handmaid, the Untended Handmaid will not have one to sell, but you can still clearly see it in her inventory, and vice versa. In addition, if you resist the temptation to interact with the Ashen Handmaid until after you've spoken with the Untended Handmaid, then this happens. Oh, thou art... Oh no, isn't anything, Ashen One. I am but a humble hand. So she clearly recognizes us, even though we'd seemingly never met. It seems almost like she has deja vu when she sees you, 
but then she doesn't bother trying to explain because presumably she doesn't think you'd be capable of comprehending the nature of her existence. And maybe she's right. So again, she appears to be more or less the same person. This is not to suggest, however, that the untended handmaid is simply in the past, while the ashen handmaid is simply in the future, or vice versa. Each time you kill her in the ashen shrine, for instance, she will respawn and raise her prices by something like 20-25%. Interestingly, this only applies to her prices in the ashen shrine, and not to those she charges in the untended shrine. This would seem to suggest that the untended handmaid is the past version of the ashen handmaid, but if you kill the untended handmaid, you'd think that the ashen handmaid would exact retribution on you by raising her prices, but she doesn't actually do that. So they share an affinity, and there's that word again, affinity of some sort, a connection that is more complex than a simple past present relationship. In a similar vein, when you kill her in the Ashen Shrine, she claims that she cannot be killed because she is undead. A malicious sort thou art, but marvel on. Remember well, I am undead, bound forever by the Shrine's curse. Well, little sense in timidity now. I'll have thee for all that worth. <laughs> when you kill her in the untended shrine, however, she does not respawn, suggesting that the fact that she respawns in the ashen shrine may have something to do with the nature of that area in particular than it does with her nature. Even though I'm not sure I fully figured out the handmaid again, I think that there are holes in the theory or the framework that I'm about to present. These problems nevertheless help me to come to a new understanding, I think, of the relationship between the untended graves and Firelink Shrine, and how those areas relate to the cosmology of the world more broadly. And I'll explain what I mean by that shortly, as we've still a few puzzle pieces to gather in this area, beginning with her dialogue. Well, fancy that. A lost lamb wandereth in, with nary a peep from the bell. Well, thou shouldst my purpose know. What can this old handmaid provide thee? So, for starters, she notes that we're here even though the bell had not rung, which means that we're not here in this specific shrine in an official capacity to bring the Lords of Cinder to these specific thrones, so that we might then link the fire. I think this is her trying to figure out who we are and what we're doing here, and it actually doesn't take her very long to figure it out. To skirt the curse's grasp, tarry not for long. Tis dark for now, and not a soul stirs, but remember, fires are known to fade in quiet. Or perhaps that captive already, like the poor girl. <laughs> I'm reasonably certain that the poor girl she mentions is the Firekeeper, because as we've discussed on several occasions over the course of this playthrough, we are in a very real sense imprisoned by the Ashen Firelink Shrine, where we are beholden to serve the institution of linking the fire. The dark sign binds us to the Ashen Shrine bonfire, which, by extension, also binds us to the Firekeeper. We are, the both of us, captives already, as the untended handmaid somewhat uncharitably and mockingly notes. The only way to skirt the curse's grasp, or so she tells us, is to hurry up and link the fire. She's basically telling us not to pull a gunner, because from her perspective, he tarried for far too long, which led to the fire quietly fading. Gunder broke the link of fire, and because of that, he somehow came to be imprisoned by the Ashen Firelink Shrine, where he judges prospective champions of Ash in perpetuity. So what I'm suggesting here, and once again I'm going to get into the details of this shortly, but what I'm suggesting is that the Handmaid both witnessed and participated in this process, whatever process it was, which led to Gunder's imprisonment. And that isn't to say the imprisonment which led Gunder to be late 
to link the fire, but Gunder's imprisonment in the Ashen Firelink Shrine. And so when we approach her initially, and she notes that we're here even though the bell did not ring, it's apparent that she's putting together the pieces of the puzzle in determining that we are a cog in the very same cosmological machinery responsible for imprisoning Gunder. Though she describes herself as little more than a humble handmaiden of the shrine, the untended handmaid not only sells the priestess ring, she also drops it when she is killed. A ring engraved with a portrait of the high priestess increases faith. In Lothric, the high priestess has long been considered one of the three pillars of the king's rule. The high priestess also served as the prince's wet nurse. Wet nurse meaning as a noun, a woman employed to suckle another woman's child. So in other words, to breastfeed another woman's child. So prior to the decline of Lothric, the Shrine Handmaid appears to have been someone very important. At minimum, she is aligned with the institution of linking the fire in general, and the crown in particular. Finally, if you've defeated the Abyss Watchers, the Untended Handmaid will sell the Wolf Knight set, helm of a knight tainted by the dark of the Abyss. The twilight blue tassel is damp and will ever remain so, a vanquished knight left behind only wolf's blood and his legacy of duty. The Undead Legion of Farron was formed to bear his torch and the armor of these Abyss Watchers suggests their own eventual end. In addition to reinforcing the point I made earlier about the false legacy of Artorias and the importance of perpetuating that narrative if you're serving the interests of the institution of linking the fire, I think this item provides the player with an important hint about the dimension or realm we are presently inhabiting. I'm almost certainly overthinking this, but consider how this item description uses the word twilight. The twilight blue tassel is damp and will ever remain so. Twilight meaning as a noun, the soft glowing light from the sky when the sun is below the horizon caused by the refraction and scattering of the sun's rays from the atmosphere. The period of the evening when twilight takes place between daylight and darkness, or a period or state of obscurity, ambiguity, or gradual decline. So he was in the twilight of his career is the example used here, and I think that's a very fitting way of describing how this particular realm operates as set apart from the realm which houses the player character's Ashen Firelink Shrine. I mean, this is a realm that is not quite as far gone as that which we see at the Kiln of the First Flame or the Drag Heap, but this area is proof that things are far worse than they are made to appear at the Ashen Firelink Shrine. It is a realm that is, as these definitions put it, between light and dark and in the midst of a gradual decline. Best not tarry long. <laughs> and a few steps away from the handmaid, we have the blacksmith hammer. Metal hammer passed down amongst blacksmiths of the shrine serves as a strike weapon, but also excels at reducing poise and breaking the guard of a shield. Of course, a hammer's true potential is realized in the hands of a blacksmith. In the same way that the player character is bound to the Ashen Shrine bonfire, Andre has been bound to the Link of Fire since the Chosen Undead linked the fire in Dark Souls 1. So for thousands of years, Andre sustained himself on souls traded to him by countless Chosen Undead. Presumably, it was not until Gunder broke the Link of Fire that Andre found himself want for souls for the first time. It's impossible to say whether Andre was a willing participant in whatever the event was which resulted in the imprisonment of Gunder and the creation of the Ashen Shrine, but he also appears to have been imprisoned in the same manner. And this hammer is the only thing that Andre left behind in this particular realm. Now, before we grab the eyes of a firekeeper, it's worth noting that if you fail Yoel of Londor's questline, an item shiny will appear in the same place we find him in the Ashen Shrine, and it contains Hollow's Ashes. 
Umbral Ash of a Hollow who faithfully served a woman, only to become separated from her. With this, the Shrine Handmaid will prepare new items. It takes but a brief glance at this thing to easily envision Londor, the foreboding land of Hollows. When we give these ashes to the Ashen Handmaid, she starts offering purging stones, poison throwing knives, and a few rings of sacrifice. Now, when we head over to the other side, we encounter an illusory wall that is concealing what is perhaps the most sensitive of the many state secrets stashed away in this area. By breaking the illusion, we find that this corner is occupied not by a blind would-be firekeeper named Irina, but by the corpse of a dead firekeeper from which we can pick up the eyes of a firekeeper. A pair of dark eyes, said to be the eyes of the first Firekeeper, and the light that was lost by all Firekeepers to come. It reveals to the sightless Firekeepers things that they should never see. So this item suggests, among other things, that the Firekeepers are systematically deprived of the capability to even imagine a future that is structured around something other than linking the fire in perpetuity. Putting aside the question of whether such an alternative future would even constitute an improvement over the status quo, the institution of linking the fire is responsible for literally and figuratively pulling the wool over the firekeeper's eyes, or <laughs> I guess taking their eyes entirely would be the literal meaning of that, but yeah. We've talked in episodes past about the idea of conditions of possibility, so I'm not going to go into that at great length here, but this is a remarkable item because I think it illustrates that idea so wonderfully, the fact that the firekeepers can't even perceive the possibility that the future might be different than the present. Maybe we'll get into that in greater detail later, but for now, let's return finally to the Ashen Firelink Shrine. So you may have noticed that even though we've just warped to what is ostensibly a different area, note that we were not greeted by a Firelink Shrine title card. It's almost like we just quit and reloaded the game, and thereby stayed in the same area, rather than warping to an entirely new area. Hi friend! Welcome home, Ashen One. Speak thine heart's desire. Ashen One, may I pose thee a question? Has the little Lord Ludleth spoken to thee of any curious matters? I sense that he possesseth some knowledge of a thing once most precious or most terrible. 
now lost to the Fire Keepers. Pray tell, is it a matter of which I should be apprised? So I don't actually know if it's having the eyes of a Fire Keeper which triggers that particular line of dialogue. But it makes sense that the game would encourage us to speak with Ludlith, giving him an opportunity to dissuade us from giving her the eyes. So let's go chat with Ludlith. Farewell, Ashen One. May the flames guide thee. Ah, found her, did we? And the black eyes that shimmer within, I see. Tis as if it were but yesterday. We did all we could to spare her from them. Much has happened since. Mayhap I should apprise thee of what the thin light of these eyes might reveal to the eyeless firekeeper. Scenes of betrayal, things never intended for her ken, visions of this age's end. In pondering whether he should apprise us about everything that's transpired since Gunder broke the Link of Fire, Ludlith seems to be trying to determine how much to tell us. Ultimately, he decides to tell us something that we already knew, that the Firekeepers are essential in maintaining the status quo, and that in order to safeguard the status quo, the institution of linking the fire has deprived them of the ability to imagine alternative possibilities and alternative futures. When we talk to him again, he provides some additional details about the eyes and explains that it was his aversion to the dark which led him to link the fire, before he goes on to question our motives. The eyes show a world destitute of fire, a barren plain of endless darkness, a place born of betrayal. So I willed myself lord to link the fire, to paint a new vision. What is thine intent? Now, now, do not be away over long. Ah, <sighs> okay, it's time to give these eyes to the Firekeeper. Welcome home, Ashen One. Speak thine heart's desire. Ashen One, are these... Are these eyes? How gracious of thee, Ashen One. The very things we firekeepers have been missing. Ashen One, my thanks for the eyes thou'st given. But fire keepers are not meant to have eyes. It is forbidden. These will reveal through a sliver of light frightful images of betrayal. A world without fire. Ashen One, is this truly thy wish? So, I don't think this choice has any impact on the gameplay, but both options are associated with unique dialogue. Since John Grimm has pledged allegiance to the Hollows of Londor and he plans to usurp the flame, of course, we are going to answer this question in the negative. But if you answer in the affirmative, she responds by essentially explaining that the dark is something different and more enticing than she might otherwise have imagined. Ashen One, is this truly thy wish? Of course. I serve thee, and will do as thou bidst. This will be our private affair. No one else may know of this. Stay thy path. 
Find lords to link the fire, and I will blindly tend to the flame. Until the day of thy grand betrayal. Ashen One, forgive me if this soundeth strange. The eyes show a world without fire. A vast stretch of darkness. But tis different to what is seen when stripped of vision. In the far distance, I sense the presence of tiny flames. Like precious embers, left to us by past lords, linkers of the fire. Could this be what draws me to this strangely enticing darkness? Farewell, Ashen One. Mayst thou thy peace discover. I assume that she's referencing the Lord Souls when she speaks about lights in the distance, but I'm not actually sure, so I'd be curious to hear whether any of you have any ideas about that. So if you do, don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below. Of course not. Please, kill me, and take these eyes away, before I am drawn into the darkness, seduced by the thin light and the awful betrayal. Farewell, Ashen One. Mayst thou thy peace discover. So, now that we've given her the eyes, you may notice that the music has changed to a song fittingly titled Secret Betrayal. But that's not the only effect this has. As you're all probably aware at this point, let's be honest, but for posterity's sake, giving her the eyes also gives us the option of refusing to link the fire after defeating the soul of Cinder. But as we'll see in a moment, the eyes affect the firekeeper in ways that most players have probably never noticed. Normally, if we find the firekeeper sitting down, she's sitting calmly with her hands folded in her lap in front of her, patiently waiting for us to give her something to do. But there is a serenity to her, a calmness, that she, she has a goal, she has a purpose, and it's a goal and a purpose that she's prepared for her entire life. It's in line with everything she knows she's been told is right and good and noble and all of those things. So. Under normal circumstances, the Firekeeper, when you find her sitting down, she's totally calm and serene. After giving her the eyes of a Firekeeper, however, she can occasionally be found sitting in a different spot, where she appears restless and anxious. She stares at her hands and occasionally lifts them to chest level before returning them to her lap and fidgeting with them even more. She appears to be clearly and profoundly affected by the eyes and the experience of vision, of being able to see alternative futures. It's something that seemingly leaves her quite unsettled and anxious, and not quite herself. The eyes show a world destitute of fire. A barren plain of endless darkness. A place born of betrayal. So I willed myself, Lord, to link the fire, to paint a new vision. What is thine intent? I took the mantle of Lord of Cinder of mine own volition. 
I speak these words with pride. Choose thy fate alone. Seize it with thine own hands. All the more should thy fate entail such foul betrayal. So even though he mentions having become a lord of Cinder of his own volition, that is to say, he decided, he was the one who made the decision, this is a decision that deep down he might actually regret, as we'll see shortly. But for now, back to the Firekeeper. So she's clearly not taking well to the eyes, but that can, in theory, be addressed. If you kill the firekeeper, no, 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 Grim, Grim, I was just, I was just speaking hypothetically, oh no. He's a professional, if nothing else. Okay, Grim, while you're at it, we might as well kill Ludlith too. Skull Ring One of Corlin's transposed wonders derived from the soul of a soul feeder, easier to be detected by enemies. The soul feeder was a beast that insatiably absorbed souls to feed its own power. Even after its accursed corpse was burned, it is said that the pungent stench of souls left the air permanently stained. I've heard it suggested that Ludlith is the soul feeder mentioned in this item description, but I think Ludlith is just Ludlith, and that he wears this ring as a trophy of sorts because he's proud of the occult methods he employed to turn the soul feeder into a piece of jewelry. Otherwise, why would he embrace the title of Ludlith the Exiled? Because he was exiled, as we learn from the Transposing Kiln item description, that he used occult methods, which essentially led him to be exiled. So I think he wears this as a trophy, but as always, I'd be curious to hear alternative ideas, so if you have one, don't hesitate to once again share it in the comment section below. So yeah, as you can see, they are both back. Like us, the Firekeeper cannot die. She is bound to the Ashen Firelink Shrine, and not even death releases her from her duty to perpetuate the Link of Fire. I'm truly sorry, but knowest thou not, I cannot die. So please, Ashen One, allow me to serve thee. The Lords have left their thrones and must be delivered to them. To this end, I am ever at thy side. Farewell, Ashen One. May the flames guide thee. It cincheth to the bone. It hurts. Please help me. Be done with me. No, God, no. I cannot bear it. It burns, burns. Help me. So Ludlith is clearly still dealing with some sort of trauma. Ah, beg pardon, I must have dozed a while. So, happened upon any twisted souls? Now, now, do not be away over long. This suggests that while Ludlith may have been willing to become a Lord of Cinder, the act of linking the fire may have been more painful than he imagined it would be. That's the most obvious interpretation of this sleep-talking episode. 
But given the fact that you only get this dialogue after killing him, I think this may also point to an alternative explanation, that Ludlith is remembering whatever act or ceremony or ritual he engaged in to create this place. Regardless of whether he was at the center of this act, initiated it, went along with it, or actively participated in it, Ludlith was clearly forced to do something drastic when Gunder broke the link of fire. We know from the transposing kiln that Ludlith was into all sorts of occult activities, activities which may be considered taboo in polite society. So when Gunder failed to show up to link the fire, and the fire faded, everyone was left scrambling. And in such a scenario, even the most polite of societies would be much more willing to engage in occult activities, forbidden dark magic, things like that, to save the society from certain ruin, which if the flame fades, the entire society has been structured to support this perpetual linking of the fire. And if the fire starts fading, you might look to someone like Ludlith and say, hey, so you know all that occult stuff we told you not to do? And I know that it was Corland he was exiled from and not Lothric, but all the same. They would presumably know that he's someone who engages in that sort of stuff. So whether or not he was the central actor in that, whether he was the one who specifically created it or if he just participated in it, I think that Ludlith played a role in the creation of this place, in the creation of a liminal ashen firelink shrine in which he is effectively a prisoner, along with the shrine handmaid as well as Andre and the firekeeper. These prisoners are distinguishable from the others here because they all respawn upon death. The firekeeper will continue to serve you, as will Ludlith, whereas the Shrine Handmaid raises her prices, as I noted earlier, and Andre flat out refuses to do any smithing for you. Ashen ones like Hawkwood, by contrast, come and go of their own volition and will not respawn after dying. The merchants we meet out in the world, like Grey Rat or Cornix, who warp here with our permission, will also not respawn upon death. So in other words, they're not tethered to this particular realm in the same way that we are and in the same way that Andre, the Firekeeper, the Shrine Handmaid, and Ludlith are. So there's something very different about those who are tethered to this place, because in fact they exist in multiple dimensions, at multiple times, and in multiple places, all at once with varying degrees of affinity between the various places in which they exist at once. So it, <laughs> I'm somewhat confused myself even in just saying all this, but in attempting to finally make sense of all this, and to make good on a promise I made something like two or three years ago, let's finally take a look at my take on the cosmology of Dark Souls 3. So rather than just showing you the entire diagram all at once, we're going to more or less follow the path that we took in this playthrough, which started all the way back in 2016 in Aegon's version of the Cemetery of Ash, so that you can get a better sense of how all these pieces fit together and why I've arranged them in the way that I have. So again, we started this playthrough in Aegon's version of the Cemetery of Ash, but uh, I've truncated a lot of the areas in this, so... I collapsed the Cemetery of Ash and Firelink Shrine into just the shrine. And likewise, an area like Irithyll, I didn't have a separate area for Irithyll of the Boreal Valley and Irithyll Dungeon, they're just one area. Same with Lothric Castle and the High Wall of Lothric. So with that said, we start with Aegon's Shrine. Now, of course, 
The Ashen Firelink Shrine isn't just for any one individual player character. It's for every single player character who plays the game. So in the context of this playthrough, that means it's not just Aegon's Shrine, it's also Grimm's Shrine. So that is John Grimm, who we're currently playing as. So F1 being Aegon's Shrine, F2 being John Grimm's Shrine, F3 being the third character that you've seen at various points, which is Regret, which is the first build I created in this game. So that's F3. And then it goes on and on and on and on. And that is FX plus one. So <laughs> someone who actually knows math or, or if you're British maths, uh, might look at this and go, what the heck is he talking about? That's not the correct notation for this or whatever. But the idea being that I'm not gonna sit here and list every, cause you know, it's impossible to list everyone who's ever played the game and that, you know, insert their name in the shrine. So just for the purposes of this illustration, I'm gonna just leave that blank. And then there's a little infinity sign. So indicating that any number of these shrines can exist but that together they exist in what I call the liminal ashen multiverse. And so it's a multiverse because it's not just one shrine that is occupied by one player character, but it's every single person who plays the game has a Firelink shrine that is an ashen place, which is liminal because it exists between the realm in which we find the kiln of the first flame on the one hand and that in which we spend most of our time in the game on the other and we'll get to those realms in a minute but this is the liminal ashen multiverse which was created following gunder's failure to perpetuate the link of fire now of course it's not actually linked these firelink shrines are not actually linked to lothric castle by land we don't walk from firelink to the high wall of Lothric, we warp there. So wherever we are warping somewhere, instead of just walking there, you're gonna see these dotted lines. So after proving ourselves worthy by defeating the Judge of Ash and plunging the coiled sword into the bonfire pit at the Ashen Firelink Shrine, we are then permitted the ability to warp, hence the dotted line, to Lothric Castle. From there, we need to collect Lord Souls. So the first step in doing that is going to the Cathedral of the Deep so that we can later access Irithyll of the Boreal Valley. From there, we go to Farren Keep to get our first non Ludleth Lord Soul, that of the Abyss Watchers. And for our second Lord Soul, we travel through the Catacombs of Carthus and Irithyll en route to the Profaned Capital. After that, we went to Anorlando to get another Lord Soul, which then resulted in us being warped back to Lothric Castle. From Lothric Castle, we went through the Consumed King's Garden, and then we found ourselves in the Untended Graves. So over the course of most of this playthrough, we've spent our time in what I'm calling the Suspended Twilight Realm. So recall that Twilight means somewhere between light and dark, while also implying that it's in a state of decline, and the reason I say it's suspended is that it would seem that in the same way that in Bloodborne, the hunter's dream was created from sort of a snapshot in time by a great one of the abandoned hunter's workshop or the abandoned old workshop. In a similar vein, and I don't think this is an accident, because of course both of those games were being developed in parallel, so we should not be surprised to see similar ideas making their way into the narrative of both games, but when Gunder failed to perpetuate the link of fire, whatever sort of drastic action that was taken by Ludlith and the Shrine Handmaid and anyone else who might have been involved, whatever they did to create the liminal Ashen multiverse also frobes, in a sense, the Twilight Realm, also froze it in time. So it's a suspended Twilight Realm, which is why when you go to New Game Plus, everything is more or less the same. Like, yeah, there are some different rings here and there, some different items here and there, but for the most part, you're doing the same thing over and over again. And that works perfectly, not only in the mechanics of the game, but also in the context of the game's story. Because if every time you link the fire, it's less effective than the previous time you link the fire, then what do you need? 
to perpetuate the age of fire. You need exponential increases in the number of people going to link the fire. How do you do that? Well, you can't just have one person. You can't rely on one person like Gunder, who is going to become imprisoned or he's going to switch up the AM PM on his alarm clock. You have to diversify your portfolio of potential linkers of the fire. If you have this Ashen multiverse with an infinite number of potential fire linkers, people who will link the fire, perpetuate the age of fire, that's really the only way to go about it. So whatever Ludlith and company did to create the liminal Ashen multiverse also appears to have frozen this Twilight Realm in place so that you could have people go from the liminal Ashen multiverse to the suspended Twilight Realm where they would gather up the souls because of course you're not gathering the cinders and putting them on the thrones in the untended firelink shrine and that doesn't open up a pathway with which you can simply walk to the kiln of the first flame instead what you're actually doing is you're transporting these cinders from one dimension to another you get the cinders from the suspended twilight realm and we're skipping ahead here because obviously in this playthrough we haven't done the Grand Archives yet, but just for the sake of illustrating my point, after we get the cinders from the Grand Archives, we're not bringing them to the untended graves and putting them on the thrones there. We are warping back to Firelink Shrine, that is to say the Liminal Ashen Multiverse, and we are putting the cinders on the thrones in this different realm, this different universe. And then from there, again, we don't just walk to the kiln of the first flame. In Dark Souls 1, the kiln was basically below Firelink, but in Dark Souls 3, it's somewhere else entirely. So once we've returned all of the cinders from the suspended Twilight Realm to the Liminal Ashen Multiverse, the Firekeeper then permits us to warp to the Flameless Shrine. And from there, we warp once again to the Kiln of the First Flame. I refer to this realm as the Entropic Ember Realm. Entropic meaning over relating to entropy. So this is a world that has essentially descended into disorder. It's been overrun by entropy. I'm not sure if that's the correct way of actually using that word so my apologies to any physicists in the house but it's a realm that is characterized by a flame that is basically dying but has just enough life in it so an ember realm it's a realm that has been overrun by disorder so it's entropic so that's the entropic ember realm and all of this of course raises the question where is the kiln of the first flame relative to the suspended twilight realm I'm not sure if there's an answer to that question, but if the bonfire in the Untended Shrine went out, then presumably that coincided with the Kiln of the First Flame. But again, I'm not sure there's an answer to that. So yeah, at its most basic level, that's it. That's my proposal for making sense of the cosmology of Dark Souls 3. Now, of course, this picture is incomplete. What's missing here is not only the DLCs, but also Archdrag and Peak, which we're headed to in the next episode. So while we're going to have to fill in those details later, for now I'm just interested in hearing what you all think about this chart. We'll return to it in the coming episodes to update it for new areas as well as to revise it based on your feedback. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you all have to say about this.
In the introductory segment, which I recorded in early June, I mentioned that I was getting closer to finishing my dissertation, but that I wasn't done just yet. Well, it's now December 18th, and I'm overjoyed to announce that even though I'm presently in the process of preparing to defend my dissertation, it's pretty much done, save for a few minor revisions I still have to make in advance of the defense. Once my dissertation is complete and officially defended and it's posted to the York University website, I will update the video description below so if you go to the video description and there's no link, it means that it hasn't been posted yet. So because I rambled on and on and on in the previous segment, I've not left myself a ton of time here to talk about my dissertation. So in this segment, I'm going to summarize how I went about conducting my research before briefly discussing my findings. In the process, of course, I'm going to provide some examples and I'll make an effort to avoid using overly technical language. But in order to situate my research and explain the significance of my findings, more thoroughly, I'm going to need a longer segment, which I think would be better suited for the next episode, given all the things that are already jam-packed into the current episode. So because I want to focus here on the process, and for the benefit of those of you watching this who might be interested in pursuing a PhD, I also want to demystify the idea of doing research. When I first decided that I wanted to go to grad school, I had a very naive and simplistic understanding of science and technology. I imagined that science and technology were somehow pure and largely existed apart from the corruptible influences of politics and culture. So I enrolled in the graduate program in science and technology studies, or STS for short, at York University, with the aim of learning how best to convince others to see science and technology in the same way that I did. And almost immediately, I realized that I didn't understand science and technology anywhere near as well as I thought I did. In STS, we speak not of science and technology, but of technoscience, a term which reflects the entanglement of technology and science. It's not that technology is applied science and that science is basic technology. The relationship between science and technology is more complicated than that, hence the term technoscience. STS is concerned with studying technoscience in society, in its appropriate social and cultural context, as opposed to more traditional academic fields which historically understood science and technology as existing apart from society. And because of this orientation, traditional scholars studied science and technology in isolation from its social and cultural context. For example, mid 20th century sociologists could study virtually anything they wanted as long as it wasn't science. Because after all, if you believe that scientific discoveries have nothing to do with society or culture, then there's no need to understand the social factors or the cultural factors underpinning that discovery. So rather than conducting social studies of scientific discoveries, sociologists focused on identifying the social factors underpinning scientific failures. In the mid 20th century, in other words, you could have a sociology of error, but you could not have a sociology of truth. So a Essentially, this was a variation on the idea that history is written by the victors. If two groups of scientists or engineers disagreed about something, it was simply assumed that the victorious group had truth on their side and that those who lost this debate were mistaken in their belief. To illustrate this point, consider this table, which shows how the outcome of a hypothetical dispute or controversy between scientist A, the eventual winner, and scientist B, the eventual loser, might have been historicized by a more traditional scholar. When looking to explain this outcome using sociological factors, we might have said that scientist B was led astray by his religious beliefs, which led him to believe falsely in theory Z. No such explanation is needed for scientist A, however, because he was correct, period. End of story. But in the 1970s, scholars in the sociology of scientific knowledge, or SSK, suggested that it was not enough to simply say that scientist A was right, therefore sociology does not apply. They called instead for the same sociological analyses to be applied to both parties in a dispute, regardless of whose ideas ultimately came to be accepted. So by examining this controversy symmetrically, we might have found that scientist A was better able to communicate his 
ideas because he had access to an abundance of financial resources, in addition to having amassed a considerable amount of social capital. This affects the other side of the coin as well, as Scientist B is revealed not to have been necessarily led astray by his religious beliefs, but by the fact that he was an adversarial communicator who did not work well with others and was rather aggressive with anyone who questioned his theory. In other words, by applying a symmetrical approach, we find that the outcome of this hypothetical dispute had less to do with the validity of the ideas being debated and more to do with the social, economic, and political standing of the various parties to the controversy. The symmetry principle provided the basis for the controversy study as a canonical genre of STS scholarship. My dissertation builds on existing applications of the symmetry principle, in addition to bringing the theoretical insights associated with the Engage program in STS, feminist STS, and post-colonial technoscience to bear on the study of technoscientific controversies. My dissertation, which I refer to as an engaged controversy study, builds on and contributes to controversy studies in STS. As past controversy studies have shown, the processes through which controversies are drawn to a close are closely related to those responsible for the production of technoscientific knowledges and artifacts. When a controversy comes to an end, in other words, it gets placed into a black box. Eventually, the debate underlying the controversy is forgotten, and the techno-scientific fact is all that remains. Accordingly, controversy analysts in STS seek to open black boxes symmetrically. They examine settled techno-scientific controversies with the aim of better understanding the relationships between science, technology, and society. Now, if you're lost, that's alright. When I first started grad school back in 2012, this was all way above my head. I was intrigued by the idea of a controversy study as well as by STS more generally, but it was really tough to find out that everything I thought I knew about science and technology was basically dead wrong. This meant that my proposed research project no longer made any sense. It was incomprehensible within this framework. I needed a new research project, but I had no idea what to do. That is until October 31st, 2012. I was making lunch in the kitchen with the news playing on the TV in the next room, and I wasn't really paying attention until I heard this. The collapse of the 2009 Sockeye run triggered a judicial inquiry into what can be done to stop the decline. PC Judge Bruce Cohen released his recommendations today after 18 months of hearings and a price tag of $26 million. The most polarizing issue was whether salmon farms are spreading disease to wild salmon. British Columbians will not tolerate more than a minimal risk of serious harm to Fraser River sockeye from salmon farms. So one of Cohen's key recommendations, ban any new fish farms in an area off Vancouver Island while research is done to investigate that risk. So if you're thinking that my dissertation is the culmination of some meticulously planned and executed program of research, it wasn't. Um, on the contrary, my graduate program was basically nothing like I expected, and my research topic essentially fell into my lap. At that point in time, I'd never even been to British Columbia. I had no background in fishing. I didn't even know there was a distinction between Atlantic and Pacific salmon. So even though I had a lot of work ahead of me, I just knew that this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to understand sockeye. I wanted to know why this fish was so controversial. I wanted to know why it was that for more than a century, this fish has been at the center of so many controversies. I wanted to know what these controversies were about if they weren't simply about declining salmon populations. And I wanted to know if the Cohen Commission had succeeded in devising durable solutions to these controversies. In other words, I resolved to open the black box that is the Cohen Commission's final report. In late 2013, I completed my master's degree in STS by writing a major research project on the subject, but I quickly realized that my ability to understand these controversies at a distance 
was limited at best. I had to travel to the Pacific coast to engage with those actually involved in salmon controversies. So I enrolled in the PhD program with the aim of doing just that. And in the summer of 2017, after completing my graduate coursework and comprehensive exams, I flew to British Columbia with the aim of addressing my first research question. What are the primary sources of controversy in the Fraser River fishery? Crucially, even though I was conducting research in the lower mainland of the province known today as British Columbia, I was also conducting research on the traditional territories of the Katsi, Kwantlen, Entelecapam, Squamish, Stalo, Chemanus, Sawasan, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam peoples. This is important to note because the vast majority of First Nations in BC never signed a treaty, and never agreed to cede their traditional territories. More than that, First Nations in BC have a constitutionally protected right to fish for food, social, and ceremonial purposes. And when I analyzed the Cohen Report during my master's research, I found that Commissioner Cohen failed to adequately account for indigenous perspectives in formulating his findings and recommendations. So in carrying out my study, I specifically sought to foreground these perspectives. Accordingly, I interviewed elders from the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, as well as a hereditary chief from the Chilliwack tribe of Stalo Nation, as well as a Stalo man from the same bloodline whose grandparents attempted to shield him from anti-indigenous racism by insisting, as he put it, that he learn the white man's way. In the process, I found that First Nations in BC continue to experience colonial violence in a number of ways, provoking a variety of complex responses. In other words, they are not merely passive victims. Over the course of my time in the field, I also attended meetings of the bilateral regulatory body responsible for managing the Fraser River fishery, in addition to visiting a variety of historically significant sites. I tried to keep an open mind throughout by making the conscious choice to collect as much data as possible, and to decide on whether or not that data was relevant later on. As a result of this approach, however, when I returned home in the fall, I had so much data that I was simply overwhelmed by it all. I didn't know where to start and how everything fit together. More than that, as I reviewed transcripts from the interviews I conducted, I puzzled over unfamiliar place names and realized that my knowledge of the BC landscape was still severely lacking. My ultimate goal was to open the black box of the Cohen Report, but I needed an entry point, and my first research question was not enough on its own to provide me with that. Then, after more than a year of attempting to cobble together all these data into a coherent analysis of the Cohen Commission, I started processing and organizing the many hundreds of pictures and videos I captured over the course of my time in the field. In thinking about how I might situate these videos in relation to the BC landscape more broadly, it finally hit me. I needed to make a map. So, using Google My Maps, I started retracing my steps through the field. In the process, I added the many pictures and videos I captured along the way. Then, I added four additional layers to the map. By drawing on my interview and ethnographic data, I addressed my first research question by identifying four primary sources of controversy. I then created cartographic representations for each of these sources of controversy. So in returning to the first research question, what are the primary sources of controversy in the Fraser River fishery? In addressing this question, I found that first, indigenous peoples in BC continue to experience and respond to colonial violence in a variety of complex ways. Second, the cumulative unintended effects arising out of a long-standing ethic of exploitation in which man is set apart from nature so that he might establish and maintain dominion over her. 
Third, the Fraser River fishery is managed according to the prevailing view that fish and fishing are principally vehicles for the pursuit of economic growth and financial profit. Fourth, anthropogenic climate change is increasingly producing adverse effects on the many ecosystems upon which Fraser River sockeye depend. Together, these sources of controversy generate salmon controversies because they lead a diverse cast of human and non-human actors to respond in a variety of complex and contentious ways. And with that, I established a basis for analyzing the Cohen Report's portrayal of sockeye salmon. I found my entry point into the black box. I added still another layer to my map, on which I mapped the spawning streams and juvenile rearing lakes for all known conservation units of Fraser River sockeye. A conservation unit is basically a unit of biological diversity. Then, using this map, I followed these fish to the Pacific Ocean and back again, pausing at various intersections and junctures along the way to ask a series of probing questions. In other words, I constructed a cartographic portrait of what I call the social life of sockeye. This provided the basis for my second research question. What salmon controversies are revealed through the social life of sockeye, and how do they compare to those depicted in the Cohen Report's overview of the life cycle of sockeye? In addressing this question, I found that the Cohen Report's life cycle overview attends only to the controversies associated with anthropogenic climate change. This reduces the life cycle of sockeye to a series of physiological transformations that are only loosely connected to the particulars of place. The social life of sockeye, by contrast, is characterized by myriad social transformations which derive meaning from the particulars of the places through which they travel and the people with whom they interact along the way. So, having finally opened the black box of the Cohen Report, I asked my third and final research question. What factors contributed to the delegitimation of particular understandings of controversial salmon during the Cohen Commission? In order to address this question, I added yet another layer to my map, atop which I explored the social life of a commission of inquiry by following various actors through the Cohen Commission. In the process, I found that Commissioner Cohen and his council engaged in the boundary work of expertise, shaping the conditions of possibility for their inquiry, and paving the way for additional forms of boundary work. Second, Cohen and his council placed a thoroughgoing emphasis on efficiently neutralizing contention, limiting the commission's ability to perceive alternative possibilities as a result. And third, Cohen and his council privileged ostensibly placeless knowledges and ways of knowing over those seeking to attend closely to the particulars of place. Together, these factors shaped and thereby problematized Commissioner Cohen's blueprint for closure. As a result of the Cohen Commission's failure to engage with the political dimensions of the boundary work of expertise, for instance, Cohen and his council treated indigenous perspectives on sockeye as potential sources of contention to be efficiently neutralized, rather than as local knowledges capable of informing fisheries management considerations at the highest levels. In calling for the production of knowledge and ignorance concerning the effects of salmon farming, and charging the Minister of Fisheries and Ocean in Ottawa with determining whether these effects pose no more than a minimal risk to Fraser River sockeye, Cohen overstated the ability of experts to account for these uncertainties, in addition to understating the role that political considerations play in informing ministerial judgment. For all these reasons, a plurality of controversial salmon and salmon controversies actively resisted the Commission's black boxing process. After all, in 2017, when I was conducting fieldwork in the Lower BC mainland, I encountered nothing but salmon controversies. In fact, as I was conducting research on the mainland, a Namji's hereditary chief named Chief Ernest Alexander Alfred was occupying a marine harvest salmon farm near Swanson Island off the BC coast. Official government processes like the Cohen Commission failed Chief Alfred and his people forcing them to take drastic steps to protect their lands, their waters, and their fish. So, to conclude this segment, I'm going to play a clip from the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society's YouTube channel, a link to which you'll find in the video description below, in which Chief Alfred reflects on his decision to take matters into his own hands. That, uh, that these, these fish are really sick. 
uh, these fish are, are polluting the environment uh, that we call home. The images that came out of that, that farm uh, are horrifying. These fish that are being harvested out of the Nula and Wakwa uh, fish pens are going straight to market. These, these fish are being cut out, the really gross parts are being cut off in these plants and they're going to be wrapped in plastic and they're being sold to the public. But more shocking is that whatever's killing these fish is just sort of pouring into our environment and pouring into the street and, and we, there's no controlling it. I, after I got off the Nula farm, I went, uh, I snuck off to the bow of the Martin Sheen and luckily nobody was around. And I just, I stared up at the cliffs and I just cried. I, I had this incredible sadness. I, I couldn't, I couldn't keep it in anymore. I, 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 uh, I lost it and I cried. I, I, I normally don't get, uh, get, get like that, but I, but uh, there was something there was something really, really wrong with that, with that whole scene. I was thinking about my grandparents, and I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about my grandchildren. Kind of all just fell on me just, just then. I I can't I can't get over the fact I can't can't get over the fact that they might win if we don't do something. Um, it it really scared me. Uh, that this has been allowed. This, they've allowed. They've allowed this to happen. If we if we don't act now, we're gonna miss this opportunity. This little window of opportunity to correct the, the mistakes of the past. You know, when I think about our people's history, and I think about the uh, colonialization, the stripping of our our rights. The stripping of our identity, the the fact that our 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 language is disappearing, the potlatch ban, the fish is is all the fish is all we have left, and they can't take our fish. We don't exist here without our fish. Okay, so before we get to the comments, uh, as usual, I say as usual, but I guess this is technically only the second episode in which we've done this, but uh, we're going to have a brief look at the Dark Souls 3 design works. And major shout out once again goes to those of you who have supported the channel on Patreon, not only because were it not for that, I would not have been able to afford to purchase the Dark Souls 3 design works, but also because over the last year especially, um, your support has been crucial in keeping me afloat. Um, given everything that's going on right now and the difficulties I've had with my job search and everything, um, and I especially appreciate that given that a lot of people's incomes have been affected negatively, obviously, by everything that's going on in the world today. So just know that I appreciate it very much and I don't take it for granted in the slightest. So first things first, we have here world concept art illustrations. And again, I don't have a viewfinder. Like I can see myself here because this is my webcam hooked up to OBS, um, but up above, uh, hanging precariously from the top of my desk is my iPhone. I hope that I framed this well uh, and that you can actually see what I'm looking at. You might not be able to because of the glossiness of the page and the fact that uh, the light is basically right above me, but I hope that you'll be able to see it nevertheless. But we can see that 
Yeah, this is, and it's labeled uh, Cemetery of Ash Exterior. And it looks more or less like it does in the final game. This is perhaps a halfway point between the Cemetery of Ash on the one hand and f Untended Graves on the other. Um, I keep getting those two confused because, yeah, they're so similar, obviously. Uh, the two areas, same area, essentially. But you can see that it's not quite as ashen as the Cemetery of Ash, but it's not quite as dark as the Untended Graves. And once again, you can see the starting grounds here, as it's called, as well as Vessel. So I suppose if there was any doubt as to whether or not this was the Lord Vessel, I guess it's not explicitly labeled as the Lord Vessel, but it is called Vessel. So yeah, that's a thing. Again, not a lot of differences here, but it's always very cool to see how the concept art compares to the final product. And you can see here, here's this bell, which I assume is the bell that rings when we are, when we rise from our grave, the, the bell that leads us to rise from our grave. I could be wrong about that, but it's the one that's closest to us because there is, of course, also the bell uh, at Firelink, right above Firelink, but yeah. And then we have Udex Gunders Arena is this one here. That's what this one here is labeled as. Uh, as well as the Gate to Firelink Shrine and Exterior 2. And wonderfully, there's, there's a tiny little guy here, so you got some scale. So now here we have the Firelink Interior, as well as the Five Thrones. You can see that surrounding the bonfire as well as the thrones, it's a lot more obvious, I think, that these are ashes. Whereas in the game, it sort of has a blue tint to it, which makes it a little bit less obvious as to what the heck it actually is. Um, but yeah. So I mentioned that in offering my... Earlier, I called my uh, the earlier episode in which it would have been episode three or four or something in which I offered what I call the treatise on the cosmology of Dark Souls 3. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking more and more that that was not so much a treatise as it was just a series of provocations about how you might relate the cosmology of Dark Souls 3 to real world, uh, real world cosmology. Um, but the more and more I think about it, I guess the the image or the map that I offered in this particular episode is more accurately, would probably more accurately be described as a treatise on the cosmology of Dark Souls 3. But in any case, whatever it was that I offered in this particular episode, the one thing that I didn't, well, there were many things that I didn't account for, some of which I pointed out in that treatise, but others which I sort of left unsaid. One of those is what the heck is the role of the Soul of Cinder, the Firelink ceremonial armor. So obviously I went into and discussed the role, the significance of ceremony and rituals when it comes to linking the fire and perpetuating the link of fire. And we can see here that it's perhaps a little bit more vexing of a puzzle than I let on the whole thing with the Soul of Cinder and the ceremonial Firelink armor. We got the Coiled Sword. I didn't talk about the Coiled Sword because, of course, that's another can of worms and we've opened enough in this episode already. But you can very clearly, or at least somewhat clearly, maybe not very clearly, but you can see in this image, which shows the Kiln of the First Flame, that... It's the soul of Cinder, or someone wearing the ceremonial Firelink armor, who is coming up against someone who very... It's so tiny it's hard to say, unless I had some sort of high-resolution scan of this or something. I, I, I can't say for certain. But it looks almost like they're both wearing the same armor. And if you think back to the first episode of this series, the very first intro I created for this series, you'll see that... The way I depicted it was there was 
Aegon of Vistora in the Historic Night set, linking the flame. And then he sort of morphs into the Soul of Cinder. And so you can interpret that in any number of ways, but it looks almost like the last person prior to us to have linked the fire was wearing the Firelink ceremonial armor. And it's an open question as to what the Soul of Cinder looked like when they fought that person who was there before them. Um, of course, by the time we get there, it's someone wearing the ceremonial Firelink armor. But this almost looks like they're both wearing it, which I think is very interesting and a puzzle that we're going to have to tease out in a future episode. Here is Udex Gunder. Again, something I didn't really delve into is the idea that this armor is based on that of a former king. And the only reason I didn't really get into that, and yes, it's explicitly labeled as Udex Gunder and not Champion Gunder, which I think is interesting, but I don't really know who the king is upon whom this armor is supposed to be based. It is reminiscent to me of the Looking Glass Knight, their armor. This might also be a reference to Demon Souls or possibly reference to Berserk, uh, these things that I'm not familiar with. Obviously, I have some familiarity with Demon Souls, but not... Uh, to the extent that I do with Dark Souls, and I don't really know anything about Berserk, so there's that. But yeah, he's looking good. I'm not really sure what else to say. Although, yes, actually, you can see, uh, though here it does not appear as though, as in, in the game, it does not appear as though there's blood stained on his helmet or his mask. There is blood stained on his breastplate, so that's a thing. And here we see Udex Gunder. It more or less appears as it does in the game, except in the game it appears as though the the pus of man infection spews out of his back, so it sort of grows out of him. Whereas here it looks almost like the pus of man is embracing him. It's very reminiscent, actually, of Lautrec's armor. Lautrec the Embrace, that like it looks like someone is embracing him if you look at him from behind. And yeah, there's something very similar going on here. So very cool stuff, I think. And over here we have the Ravenous Crystal Lizard, which it's hard to make out what is what in this particular um, depiction of the Ravenous Crystal Lizard, but... Very interesting, nevertheless. And of course, the Firekeeper, who more or less appears here as she does in the game. Perhaps the whatever it is she has wrapped around her wrists and her hands, they appear almost like bandages. They look a little bit more bloody than the ones that you see in the game, but this was especially noticeable to me when we we're looking at that rare spawn after you give the Firekeeper the eyes and she's sort of inspecting her hands and you can see spots of blood on her hands. Um, and I'm, I'm not really sure what the significance of that is. Perhaps um, it's a way of pointing to the fact that she has blood on her hands um, because she plays such an integral part. The Firekeepers play such an integral part in perpetuating the link of fire. I'm not sure if that's what that's meant to convey, but here you can see she has sort of an overcoat on. In this one, she appears to have no overcoat. The sort of mask, it's not really a mask, uh, the blindfold slash tiara, hairpiece, whatever you want to call this thing, is rendered here in considerable detail, which is, yeah, very interesting. I'm not really sure I have much more to say about that, though. Of course, she's not wearing shoes, because who needs shoes when you're just walking on ash all the time? But her feet look appropriately weathered as a result. And here we have Ludlith of Corlin, or Ludlith the Exiled, who is looking... <laughs> he's looking a little bit more devious and sinister than he does in the final game in which, and maybe it's just because, you know, they're playing on your pre-existing biases that he's a person who, he's small, he's not of large stature, he talks like a grandfather, so maybe you're thinking 
he's not a bad guy, but eh, at least from the perspective of the concept artist, it seems he drew him with a very, like, very evil and sinister looking grin, I'd say. And I think that's more or less it. I was looking for the Chaos Blade previously so that we could see whether or not or to what extent you could actually see the uncanny streaks on the Chaos Blade that were mentioned in the item description. For whatever reason, it does not appear as though the Chaos Blade is listed in or included in the design works. Perhaps it was too uncanny to even be printed there. So I guess that's going to do it for the design works segment of the episode. So before I get to the comments, I'll just say once again that I hope you're all doing well, in spite of everything that's transpired in the last year. I'm not going to discuss the pandemic at length in this episode because my intent in making this episode was principally to provide viewers with an escape from the real world, so this is going to be a short rant, I promise. First and foremost, I wanted to offer my condolences to those of you who have lost someone during this time, whether directly to COVID-19 or indirectly as a result of its many secondary impacts. I'm so very sorry for your loss, and I'll be keeping you in my thoughts. I am, of course, extraordinarily fortunate and privileged in a number of ways, and that has been borne out over the course of this pandemic, as no one close to me has passed away. Of course, the pandemic has affected me in other ways. It's made an already difficult job search far more difficult, as public sector budgets have been slashed more or less across the board to offset plummeting tax revenues. It's also taken a toll on me emotionally because I've obviously been unable to spend much time with my parents, my grandmother, my siblings, and my four wonderful nieces. Thankfully, my relationship with my fiancé has only grown stronger in the past year, despite the fact that we've spent virtually every waking moment together during that time. Of course, it's been a major, major challenge trying to plan our wedding amidst all of this, but the last thing we want to do is host a super spreader event, and the situation obviously continues to evolve and change on a daily and weekly basis, so unfortunately our wedding is probably not going to be anything like we originally envisioned for it, but honestly, as long as everyone is safe and I get to marry the woman I love, I don't really care what the wedding looks like. But as I'm recording this commentary track, I'm heartened by the fact that there appears to be a light at the end of the tunnel, as vaccines are finally, mercifully, on the way. Since the start of the pandemic, I've driven thousands of kilometers to deliver food and supplies to the immunocompromised members of my family. And even though I'm more than happy to do my part to help keep them safe, I'm just... I'm tired. I just want to hug my parents and my grandmother, I want to play silly games with my nieces, and I want to play poker with my siblings. This holiday season is going to be depressing in the absence of those things. But we're almost there. I know everyone is tired. I'm tired too. And please, pardon my language when I say this, but please keep your distance from others when you're out in public and wear your fucking mask properly. Make sure that it completely covers your nose and your chin. I'm sorry, but not covering your nose with your mask is just silly. You can catch or transmit COVID-19 through your nose, but more importantly, you look really, really dumb with your nose <laughs> popping out of your mask. Seriously though, wear your mask properly. We live in a society in which we've always been told that we are first and foremost individuals and that as individuals we can do pretty much as we please. Adding to that, COVID-19 could be anywhere, but it's mostly nowhere. So in that context, I get it. I understand why many people have struggled with the restrictions, but even though it's mostly nowhere, COVID-19 could be anywhere. And it cares not for your liberties, it doesn't care about your beliefs or your politics. If you're not careful, you can, and you will, 
hurt others. We're so close, so please don't let up now. Next Souls Miss, we can hopefully go back to normal, but this holiday season, please be mindful, be careful, and be responsible. With all that said, I know that not everyone is as fortunate or as privileged as I am, and that COVID-19 disproportionately impacts people of color, those who are not cis men, and those who are poor, and especially people with disabilities. Some people simply have no choice but to potentially expose themselves to the virus, and I wanted to acknowledge that. But what I'm trying to say is just be careful, take care, and be mindful of how your actions may affect others. We're almost there, friends, so just hang in there as best as you can, and take care. As usual, there were a ton of tremendous comments left on the previous episode, far more than I'm able to read out on the show, unfortunately, so if your comment was among those that I'm not able to read out, please accept my sincerest apologies for that. Maxwell Black writes, It's entirely possible that Kamui did kill Emma, given the point that was made about Ubidachi and the fact that Emma clearly supports linking the fire, as she tells you please save Prince Lothric's soul, and helps you get the other Lords of Cinder. This plus the fact that Kamui, like Albert, is seen at the end of the Grand Archives trying to stop you, demonstrating that he is against the linking of the fire. This leaves Kamui with motive, means, and a weapon named Old Woman Killer. You discussed an alternative possible game where it was Kamui helping you, but it seems more likely that Kamui killed Goddard and is pretending to be dead for some reason in front of the archives, as you can still see him blink. I have no idea why he would do this, but that is not a corpse, that is a conscious person laying there, with the sheath to the Onakiri and Ubidachi on his back. So this is obviously something that we're going to discuss when we get around to doing the Grand Archives, but I suppose for the time being you could file this one under were the giants in Dark Souls 2 supposed to have teeth? Because in the same way that you can angle your camera and see what is ostensibly a corpse blinking, in one of the giant memories in Dark Souls 2, if you angle your camera just right, you can see the face of a giant who appears to have teeth. And of course, the rest of the giants just have holes in their faces. So you can file this problem under the same category as the giant with teeth. Was it actually supposed to be there? Is it supposed to tell us something? Or was this just a developer oversight? So this is a question that we'll obviously have to revisit at a later date. With respect to the stone tablets in Osiris's boss room, Darkblood Souls writes, With regards to the Arabic text, the actual text was copied and pasted from a newspaper article talking about trains in Egypt. LOL, it doesn't mean anything. So, <laughs> and this is what I love about this series and, and the international nature of doing a series like this on YouTube. The fact that we have people from all around the world watching this and people who speak all variety of languages, because you can see that in some cases, once again, the developers aren't necessarily doing every single thing in the game intentionally. Not everything is a hint about the story. Many things will be, even where they don't appear to be, but in some cases it's just as simple as a bunch of Japanese developers thinking that they can just get away with copying and pasting some unknown script from a newspaper onto a stone tablet, and then, yeah, so. So yeah, that one is, is rather disappointing, but thank you kindly, Dark Blood Souls, for pointing this out. I really appreciate it. So my apologies in advance if I get this wrong, but TN Loops writes, Consume King's Garden with Lothric Castle, in general, really are the linchpin of the lore of the game for me. The ideas brought up by Candidate about angels and transformations in general really fleshed out the area. While I tend to find unused content fascinating, the Osiris boss fight is something I think FromSoft was better leaving out. Even if it was for purely raiding reasons, the content itself ended up being quite simple models slash textures, and doing it this way opened much room for varied interpretation. 
My personal favorite was the idea of Ocelot holding what was one of Gwendolyn's corporeal illusions, Guinevere having given that to her husband to placate him while the real child was raised by Gwendolyn as Yorshka, being told tales that she reminded him of, giving up what is frankly a quite disturbing scene to gain much more room to maneuver within the lore seems to be a very understandable decision for From to make. It is a little unfortunate that after the alpha footage was recovered, a lot of the discussion around the topic has stopped and it has somewhat stagnated into ESRB issues. This is even more unfortunate when you consider things like possible dialogue changes and so on. People poking around early versions and alpha builds have brought us much insight into these games, with Consume King's Garden being a good example. It is a shame if these discoveries such as the original boss fight or initial area, God's Grave, end up stifling the discussion instead. So that's a very interesting comment and I thank you kindly for making it. And as in all things, I think it's more or less about just finding the appropriate balance. You could make a reasonable argument that FromSoft perhaps could have added a little bit more detail to certain aspects of the game to flesh out the story while still maintaining wiggle room. But on the other hand, there are cases like this where, yes, undeniably, I think it's better that we have that open-endedness because we've talked about this in several episodes in this series and in past series, but that's the whole idea behind Hidetaka Miyazaki. And I realize that he is not from Soft. He's not a monolith. He's not the only person designing these games. But ever since Miyazaki rose to prominence at FromSoft, FromSoft's games have taken on the character of when Miyazaki was a child and he's told this story, and again, I've covered this story before, he would go to the library, an English library, and he was taking out fantasy books, but he barely spoke English, so he had to fill in the gaps of the story. He understood bits and pieces here and there, which is why in the Dark Souls series especially, it appears as though it's a western swords and sorceries kind of story, but it's not. That's, that's more or less just a skin on the outside, or it remixes elements of those stories with spiritual stuff from the East that most of us in the West are just not familiar with. So that's why FromSoft stories have this odd sort of uncanny characteristic to them, because their approach to telling stories in their games is more or less consistent with what Miyazaki was doing as a kid, which is filling in blanks in the author's text with your own imagination, which is informed by your own individual situated experience and perspective, such that the story doesn't just have a single meaning, there's a multitude of meanings encompassed by it. So, so yeah, so I think that's a really interesting comment, and as always, it's about finding that balance. For a lot of people, I think Dark Souls 3 is too open-ended, but as you probably would have been able to tell in my long rambling rant about my idea for the cosmology of Dark Souls 3, I love, absolutely love that world building stuff that you need to do to understand a story that is so fragmented like this. So yeah, thanks again TN Loops for a very thoughtful and thought-provoking comment. Reichsite writes, There's an item I think needed a more in-depth analysis, the water stagnation in the King's Garden. Not only stagnation is a recurrent theme in the Souls series, but also in most recent FromSoft game Sekiro, where it plays a prominent role throughout the plot. As you said, fire and dark are part of a cycle. From this premise, it's quite obvious that the natural curse of the world is a loop between both, like a river that keeps flowing. With the first linking of the flame by Gwyn, the whole world became stagnant in one era. Stagnation leads to decay and corruption. So as we see in the pus of man, humanity is breeding infected tissue or cancerous growths that eventually take over the host. As to why the King's Garden is toxic, it could be because of two non-exclusive reasons. The first one being the garden seems to be flooded. It's very common when the soil can't drain the water to create the conditions that allow some life forms to thrive, like algae. Harmful algal blooms are a very serious hazard that can create toxins for days or months. The second possible reason is what consumed Osiris, the obsession with Seath, the scaleless, and the creation of a divine air that could link the fire. 
As we see in his boss arena and the unused model of Ocelot, there are a lot of crystals. A very good point you guys made is that Seath seems to have a sort of beauty or grace that Oseros does not. This is likely because he didn't obtain this crystal magic by natural means. So if he used a biochemical process to replicate the crystals, it's likely to also create waste as almost every mining endeavor does, therefore creating toxic sludge that polluted the garden. Thank you kindly for this Reich site because I think that this is very interesting and I think that this idea is consistent not only with mining, that as Reich site points out, mining creates waste. You can't get around it, but it also applies to things like salmon farming. So again, I'm gonna have to wait until the next episode before I talk about this in any more detail, but there's a very good reason why aquaculture corporations want to have their salmon farms in the ocean along the migratory routes of wild salmon where they are not only protected from the strong tides of the ocean, but where they also don't have to worry about waste disposal. So you hear aquaculture corporations saying that closed containment aquaculture, that is to say when you are raising fish in a hatchery in a closed containment aquaculture facility, that it's not profitable. And there's a very simple reason for that, and that is, again, they're essentially just nets in the ocean. So when they give their fish antibiotics, when they feed their fish, when the fish use the bathroom, so to speak, all of that waste just sinks or it gets carried away with the tide. In any case, it, the situation is so complex that no one can say for sure what the impact of that is. But one thing is for certain, and that is that it's not that open net pen salmon farming is profitable and closed containment is not. The real issue is that when you have a salmon farm in the ocean, the ocean is bearing the cost of your waste disposal. So the salmon farms are externalizing the costs associated with waste disposal that they otherwise would have to pay if they were on land. So that's why these aquaculture corporations don't want to move their facilities on the land because it would cost too much because they'd have to worry about waste disposal. So yeah, don't eat farm fish, it's awful. <laughs> Um, I could rant about this for another couple hours, so I'm going to leave it at that for now, but thank you Reichsite for giving me another opportunity to <laughs> ramble on about my dissertation. Santi C writes, Regarding the Silver Knights and their hollow status, I think that they may be hollow due to the deacons essentially tainting the Anorlando water supply with dregs. Yorshka mentions that Gwendolyn has fallen ill and it would also explain why all the Irithelian slaves are seemingly taking orders from the Pontiff and or Aldrich. So yeah, I don't have a ton to add here except to say once more th these are the kinds of comments I love and observations that I just find so interesting because it builds on what we already know about the world in a very plausible and internally consistent manner. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Santisi. Phantom of Black writes, Hawkwood sitting at the gravestone is a random occurrence that happens whenever you show up at Firelink regardless of whether or not you've defeated the Abyss Watchers. I think you might need to have gone to the High Well of Lothric beforehand, but if you look around whenever you spawn at Firelink, you'll notice that Hawkwood isn't there sometimes. He's at the gravestone. It can also happen more than once. I'm not sure if I said something different, something which contradicted this in the previous episode, but before recording this commentary track, I actually did some testing by rezoning with John Grimm several times, and at this point, he's no longer around. I think that's because we spoke with him at the gravestone and then we grabbed the shield. So because we've advanced his storyline to the point where it's at, we are not going to be seeing him again until the next episode when we find his summon sign in Arch Dragon Peak. But for the record, here's what the guide says. And of course the guide isn't always right. The guide has errors in it. 
Uh, we've talked at length before about some of the issues with Prima games as opposed to Future Press, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to open that can of worms again. But here's what the guide says about Hawkwood. Speak with Hawkwood after defeating the Great Wood or Crystal Sage bosses to acquire a heavy gem. Defeat the Abyss Watchers and speak with him to acquire the Farron Ring. You may occasionally find Hawkwood paying his respects to a grave outside the shrine on the right side. After you have exhausted Hawkwood's dialogue and defeated all three of the above bosses, Hawkwood departs, leaving Hawkwood's shield at the grave. At this point you won't see Hawkwood for a long time. He'll appear again as a white phantom sign in the Consumed King's Garden. After that, if you find your way to Archdragon Peak, his white phantom sign can be found not far from the third bonfire. So that's as far as I'm going to read because obviously I don't want to spoil what's going to happen in the next episode, but what I suspect Hawkwood is doing at this very moment in our playthrough is getting his butt kicked <laughs> at the last bonfire in Archdragon Peak because, yeah, he needs your help to get to the top of that mountain. He can't do it on his own because, yeah, he kind of... <laughs> At least as a phantom, he sucks, but we'll talk about that in the next episode. With respect to the Ritual Time of Day system, which we discussed in the previous episode, Scholar of the Worst Game writes, Just have some quick thoughts regarding the unused skyboxes and associated systems from a previous version. I believe there's probably two related major reasons for their ultimate decision to move away from that direction with things. The first is that the sort of system this collection of unused material represents would be highly incongruous with the internal logic of time, or at least variations in the celestial situation associated with the passing of time in our universe on our planet, and place established by the last two games. One that is obscure enough in itself but is broadly characterized by a multitude of chronological slash celestial situations, each coextensive with and delimited by spatial slash geographical zones. In other words, it will never turn to night at Firelink Shrine, Archdragon Peak, or Majula. It won't turn to day at Darkroot, the Huntsman's Copse, or the Lost Bastille. As experienced, this world is always having reached a sort of essential stasis, despite the perpetual and universal decay and decline affecting everyone and everything. Changes in celestial situation become associated rather exclusively with changes taking place in the world historic situation of gods, humanity, and so on. Paradigmatic is the case of the sun disappearing from Anor Londo when Gwyn departed. Another example being the all-consuming darkness that comes with the extinguishment of the flame. This ties into the second reason, which is that the abandoned version of the game and the system seemingly in place involve placing an undue amount of attention on the celestial bodies themselves. The spectacular, unused skyboxes make the celestial bodies themselves seem to be the site of eventual change in action, like what is happening is somehow an effect of or otherwise originating in or on the sun or moon themselves. In the finished version of the game, the dynamism of celestial situations and events is much more a reflection of the course of history and the world and is thus limited to one major event, while otherwise preserving the usual union of place and time across in-game areas. I think they probably became self-aware of this sort of cross-pollination of ideas from Bloodborne, where the protracted course of the day unfurling with progression in the game has completely distinct significance within and as part of that universe's internal logic, and saw where the sudden imposition of such significance on the time of day was a poor fit for the series and likely constrained what they were doing story-wise as well as with visual aesthetics. I don't really have a ton to add to that other than to say this is once again another case in which cut content isn't necessarily a bad thing. The eventual direction they went with wasn't necessarily just slapping things together because they ran out of time or they ran out of resources or they wanted to rush the game out the door. The game was better off and more consistent with its earlier iterations by going with the system they ended up going with in the end. I also don't think the cosmological framework I outlined earlier in the episode would have made any sense under the previous time of day system. And though it did my head in trying to devise a framework which fit all the puzzle pieces we've been given, I think the end result is more interesting than that which FromSoft seems to have been going after in the earlier iterations of the game. So yeah, 
I, I said I didn't have anything to add, and then I added a bunch of stuff, so <laughs> thank you, Scholar of the Worst Game. So another name, the pronunciation of which I'm probably going to butcher, is Herather. 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 <laughs> regarding your idea that the, uh, I'm sorry. Regarding your idea that the deep might have been named as such in order to invoke the unknown of the ocean, I've had an interesting thought about that for a while. Ash Lake has pretty deep waters that are also kind of dark, and we know that dregs sink to the lowest depths imaginable. Considering Ash Lake is probably the lowest point of the world and Merkmen rise from the depths, there might be a connection there. Maybe the abhorrent things to which the Deep became home were all the corpses of the dragons from the Great War with the Gods and the corruption of the waters festered by the time of Dark Souls 3. Regardless, I have to disagree with your thought that the Deep is an abyss that's more abyssal than the Abyss. I always thought of the Abyss as a consequence to Gwyn's actions. After he branded humanity with the dark sign and linked the first flame, the Age of Dark wasn't allowed to occur as was ordained. So the Abyss is a sort of twisted manifestation of what that age would have been, ravaging and warping the world around it because it has lost both its place in the world and its connection to humans. Going by these ideas I presented, I don't believe the Abyss and the Deep are connected in any concrete way. Correct me if I'm wrong, of course. I'm very fascinated by these concepts and I'd like to learn more. Well, I'm not sure that I can correct you because I don't know that you can be wrong in any meaningful sense in these types of conversations because we're all just sort of feeling our way around in the dark here. Um, no pun initially intended, but I decided I would roll with it. So yeah, I find that very interesting. I'm not really sure I have anything to add. In reply to High Raither, William writes, More likely is that Aldrich's feasting allowed blood, humanity, to seep into the cathedral's soil and water. So they tossed piles of bodies and blood into their sewer, and eventually all the latent humanity on those bodies are the dregs that sink. I do agree it could be Ash Lake, but we have no proof. I also agree on the Abyss and Deep being two different things. The Abyss is a corrupting force that's either the result of the Age of Fire weakening or humanity in humans evolving. The Deep is beyond human knowledge. It's an eldritch truth, which is supported by Aldrich's name, or spiritual energy that has been corrupted as explained in The Bastard's Curse. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have. Um, I know that I started recording this episode back in June, but pre-production for this episode actually started a lot earlier, so all told I think I've been working on this episode for about a year now, and it's finally done. So well, in actual fact I have to go and do editing and, and get it out the door because it's December 18th when I'm recording this, and I want to have this episode up for Soulsmas Eve or Soulsmas, so December 24th or 25th. And yeah, I am exhausted already because I've been working on this video pretty much non-stop for a week because I have a brief lull in my schedule as I wait for feedback on my dissertation from the various committee members and the people who need to greenlight it in order for me to successfully have defended my dissertation. So I don't know when the next episode of this series will be out. I'll start working on it as soon as possible, of course. You won't have to wait another year. So the next episode, episode 21, will almost certainly be out before December of next year. Um, I can't make any promises as to when it will be out because, of course, I have to actually defend my dissertation, I have to look for a job, and I'm also getting married in April. If you'd like to have a better idea of where I am currently with the next episode and how long it's going to take, I would recommend following me on Twitter. There I post updates a lot more frequently than I do to YouTube, which at this point is more or less I only post to YouTube when I have something substantial to actually post. 
But if you'd like to get some idea as to where the episode presently is and how much longer it's going to be until it's out, follow me on Twitter at Aegon underscore of underscore Astora. And that's going to do it for this episode. So please, friends, be safe. Remember, the vaccine is right around the corner. Try to stay home if you can. If you can't, wear a mask, wear it properly. Try to remember that, yes, you have rights as an individual. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I don't imagine that any of my viewers are the types of people to wear their mask beneath their nose. But we're almost there. We're almost there. And then we'll be done with this thing, hopefully, forever. Because, <laughs> yeah, it, I don't know how well, as a world and a people, we can handle another 2020. But, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that this is the only video I will have released this year. But I hope that you appreciate the amount of effort and time that went into it because, you know, I thought doing an episode by myself was going to be easier, but I actually think it was harder in the end and it was more work because normally I can just sort of say, oh, we're here in this place and we picked up this item. So guess, what do you think that means? And I don't actually have to know anything. I can just... <laughs> I can just put that all on my guests. So doing this all by myself and actually put the onus on me to have some idea of what I'm talking about, to do some research. And obviously I do research even when I have guests on, but the level of research in this episode far, far exceeds uh, really any video on this channel, believe it or not, even though it's just the untended grades. But yeah, I'm exhausted. So I'm going to go finish editing this so that I can try to have it up for Soulsmas Eve. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season, despite just, again, the sheer awfulness that is 2020. So thank you all very, very, very much for joining me, and I will see you in the next one. Bye bye <laughs>